and Michael Remus. What's going on, gang? It is Friday. Welcome to Winnipeg Sports Talk, and we have a banger of a show today. Lots to get to as the Jets practice today and hit the road this afternoon on a three-game road trip to Ottawa tomorrow afternoon, Boston on Monday, and then the Toronto Maple Leafs at Scotiabank Arena Wednesday night before finishing up the uh, portion of the schedule before the player break with a home game against the Leafs next Saturday at Canada Life Centre. We'll hit all of that. Busy night in the National Hockey League with lots going on. We'll touch on that as well. Um, And, of course, it's the divisional weekend in the National Football League Headlined by Chiefs Bills on Sunday night. Lee Hacksaw Hamilton is going to join us. And when uh, when we get Scott Billick and Brandon Rowicki in with us, we'll talk mostly Jets hockey and uh, the local topics. But I will certainly lean on those guys for uh, maybe a pick or two for their favorites for this weekend in the uh, divisional round. For my money, the best weekend of the year. Top eight teams. So much on the line. Four standalone games, but it does get me a little a little antsy knowing that after this weekend, there's only going to be three NFL games this season, and then we got a long wait before the Bombers and the CFL get going. Luckily, though, we've got a first-place hockey team that I think is uh, occupying most people's thoughts right now. Um, the Vancouver Canucks last night uh, did manage to jump the Winnipeg Jets into... The uh, into the top spot by points, but the Jets are still number one in points percentage, so that will be our measure for who's number one in the league today. And yes, the Jets are still the best team in the league. Uh, listen, we're going to kick that around with Michael Remus coming up in just a minute. Um, but uh, we'll also head out to Ottawa. And if you remember through the end of the summer when we were following the FIBA uh, Canada at the FIBA World, uh, World Cup of Basketball, uh, Alex Adams in Ottawa um, was uh, kind enough to join us from uh, Jakarta, Indonesia a few times. Well, Alex is actually covering the Sens right now. So uh, we're going to have Alex come on in a, in a little bit and uh, get the latest on the struggling Sens, who did get a win last night, as well as some reports, which we'll talk touch on right off the top, of the Winnipeg Jets kicking tires on Jacob Chikrin according to Bruce Garriock in Ottawa. So it uh, should be a fun show. Uh, Rewicki, Alex Adams, Billick, Hacksaw, and of course we'll finish off with a marble race before the end of the program as we do every Friday here on WST. Just before we bring in Reem, big thanks to our sponsors. Of course, our partners at Coolbet Canada just finished the lock shop with Dusty and Pat making our picks for the divisional round. You can go and check that out. Remus and I will get our favorites as well as a few player props later on when we dive into the cool bet lines i also want to thank our friends at canadian club canada's number one favorite whiskey manitoba battery modern man barber shop the winnipeg jets f apparel wallace and wallace aikens lake boston pizza royal sports little brown jug and of course sport manitoba and manitoba liquor and lotteries michael remus it's friday what's going on how you feeling Feeling great here, Huss. Real good on a Friday. Looking forward to the weekend. The Jets back in action uh, tomorrow, which is exciting. And I don't know. They're back on the ice today, so we got stuff to talk about. It's great. And Oh, yeah, Marble Race, NFL. Lots going on this weekend. I haven't even thought about the temperature. Yeah, you know, I got back, obviously, um, coming in hot to the show on Tuesday. Went to the game on Tuesday night. 
but after the weekend that I had and the travel, it had it, uh, this was actually a perfect just little mini break, I think, for the Jets and for fans. Um, I can't. I'm, I'm fired up, and I, I love the fact that this is a two o'clock game tomorrow. We can get right into it with the hockey when the hockey's finished. We'll flip over and join the Ravens and Texans in uh, somewhat of the undercard. I know Connor, who's a big Niner guy. All my Packer fan buddies are ready for tomorrow night at, at uh, in Santa Clara. And then no hockey to worry about. Two big games, Lions and Buccaneers early on Sunday. And then the main event, Allen, Mahomes, Chiefs, Bills doing it once again. All the, Every time those teams play, it's been an absolute thriller. I don't expect any different um, so we'll certainly touch on that throughout the uh, throughout the afternoon. Shout out to everybody in chat. Great to see you all. Make sure to hang around. And for all you n- new l- viewers and listeners of Winnipeg Sports Talk, Fridays about 2.45 is when we do the marble race. If you haven't been in it before, make sure to pop in. You'll have an opportunity to enter, to, uh, to enter for free and win a WST hoodie. Shout out to B.A. Booger, who was our winner last week. And... Uh, Fired him out a message today to uh, to get that to pick that up, but we'll save the football talk for a little later, Reem, because of course the Jets on the ice today, and uh, I guess the big news right off the hop, no fifty five. Um, everybody else out there in a regular jersey, and Rick Bonus has said Mark Scheifele will not play tomorrow against Ottawa, but is making progress. Will travel with the team, but his status for the road trip is TBD. I know Shifley's going to want to play in that game in Toronto. That is, um, I think, what goes without saying. Um, a lot of friends and family for the Ontario guys when they get out there and certainly want to be a part of the Winnipeg Jets right now that just keep on winning and staying on top of the uh, of the of standings in the Central Division where they did get some help last night and the rest of it. But uh, we, we heard earlier this week that Shifley was a possibility for Ottawa uh, didn't get our hopes up too much, and uh, it's a good thing because uh, they will once again be without their number one center, which is uh, a big hole in the lineup, even with the way the club played and managed to win against the Islanders. Yeah, what's going on with the Jets? Right when someone comes back, another person uh, gets injured. We saw Velarde out, then Connor you know, comes back. Connor's out. Connor's ready to come back. Shafley gets injured. Kind of funny. Uh, well, it's not funny, but it's... I guess it's kind of nice that it's worked out that way. But, yeah, Mark Schaefer, you're, what, number one leading scorer, 41 points uh, in 41 games. And, look, they said today that he didn't was out for Saturday, hasn't been skating, hasn't really been working out, he's been getting treatment. So you hope that he's ready for one of those two games against Toronto. You need Mark Schaefer in Toronto, the place where he scored his first career goal. He's from the area. And, of course, on uh, who want to stick it to the national audience, so you hope that he's okay. He is going on the trip. That's a, a good sign. But we'll have to wait. We'll have to wait and see what happens. Fingers crossed for Monday or Wednesday. Uh, I mean, it, hey, it was credit to the Jets for being able to beat a team like the Islanders without Mark. Um, they need him in the lineup, though. I mean, everything just seems so different. The offensive potential of the team goes down significantly. And listen, credit to Adam Lowry with the way that he's playing and filling in as well as Vlad Demetsnikov and Toninato. And I thought Kapari had a real strong game as well. But, I mean, Mark Shifley, point-of-game player, number one center, the uh, the key cog in that top line, um, the sooner he can get back, the better. Now, they are going up against an Ottawa team that has not been very good this year. They did get a big win last night and kind of exploded for a little bit of offense. Um, but you hope the Winnipeg Jets can find a way to get two points. And I, I will say this. I think trying to go into Boston and beat the Boston Bruins without Mark Shifley will be a tall task. So fingers will be crossed in the Jets nation that Shifley might be able to go on Monday night. But he won't be in the lineup tomorrow. Um, and we'll get a couple of clips from practice today. But the the power, uh, Connor, of course, uh, Connor Rabchak was down this morning. And the power play without Mark Shifley looking uh, like this, uh, Velarde, Ehlers, Lowry, Connor, and Morrissey, and the PP2 unit, Cole Perfetti, Niederreiter, and Pionk with Vlad Nemetsnikov and Nate Schmidt on those units as well. And 
you know, the Jets have done a great job playing without Ehlers for a while, playing without, or, well, having him come back, Velarde for an extended stretch, Connor for an extended stretch. But from my perspective, Reem, everything, um, it's just different when Mark Scheifele's out, and there's a lot that falls on a number of players to really make up for the offensive catalyst wearing a Jet jersey night in, night out. Yeah, I mean, Nikolai Ehlers, you know, since... He had a bit of a slow start to the year, Huss, and since he's been on that top line now, he's really exploded, and I just showed the scoring leaders here. Here he is, 33 points in 43 games, second on the team in scoring, tied with Josh Morris, who's also got 33 in 43. So, uh, you know, he's a dynamic player. I think it just gives him more of a role on power play one. They're looking forward to seeing that, and I kind of like having the two big guys, Velarde and Lowry in front, and Adam Lowry's... You know, he had that slump last year, but you saw him step it up in the playoffs. He stepped it up in the last couple of games. The offensive production, you're kind of like skeptical. Like, hey, he's not really a first-line center. Maybe not for long-term, but short-term, he's certainly shown that he's capable. And, uh, you know, he had an offensive touch in junior. Maybe it's just taken a while to show some of that off here uh, on pace for a career year in terms of points. That is the captain, Adam, Adam Lowry. So that is uh, the top power play. And... I see people in chat knowing, oh, Ottawa has the lowest ranked penalty kill. So uh, a nice matchup here and good opportunity for the Jets to put some pucks in the back of the uh, Senators net. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, Lowry has had a, uh, I mean, such a great season. And, you know, the numbers are, the numbers are great. I mean, eight goals, 15 assists, 23 points, 40 penalty minutes, and doing it mainly from, a third line role, a third line that does play a lot, gets all the tough matchups. Um, but I mean, listen, I, I think we all realize guys need to step up and play maybe above where they're normally at when guys like Mark Scheifele are out and it's Lowry that is getting that opportunity right now. But you're exactly right. I mean, long term, Adam Lowry's perfect spot is running a dominating third line. It's not necessarily being a top line center. And um, listen, with the return of Kyle Connor. Um, who I, I thought had a lot of jump to his game and, you know, was shooting the puck, was trying to find his spots, and obviously made a nice defensive play to free himself for an empty netter. Puts them into a situation where they do have some more punch, and Velarde's been great. And, and I know there's been a lot of talk about Ehlers playing on that second line, but I do maintain, like, would I like to see them play a little bit more? Yes. The more Ehlers, the better when he's out on the ice. But I do think that having Ehlers playing with Perfetti and Nemetsnikov makes that second line the best version of that line that they can have. Because Ehlers of maybe even beyond Connor or Velarde is the guy that can drive a line offensively the most himself and I think get the most out of his line mates right now. Um, so as long as Shifley's out, I think they probably should lean a little bit more on the Ehlers line. And um, we'll see how that kind of shakes down tomorrow. Uh, but Ehlers with Domestikoff and Perfetti, line two, after Lowry, Velarde, and Connor, Dominic Toninato moving up into Lowry's spot on the third line with Appleton and Nino. Uh, Appleton, of course, breaking that 25-game goal-scoring slump last week with that greasy one that ended up being the winner against the Islanders. And Rasmus Kapari, you got back into the lineup playing with Morgan Barron and Alex Ayafalo on the fourth line. And, you know, we didn't talk a lot about the fourth line after uh, the game on uh, on Wednesday, Reem, but I thought they were really good. I thought Kapari looked awesome getting back into the lineup. And Alex Ayafalo continues to make things happen regardless of who he's out there and who he's playing with. Yeah, Alex Ayafalo, he's played now. He's at bingo. He's played on every line. Uh, you can put him in anywhere. So <laughs> uh, congratulations to him. Go to the front and... Collect your prize. You know, we kind of we kind of joked about Rasmus Kupari like being at the top of the NHL edge stats in terms of speed, saying, "Oh, here's the shift." But man, that guy, you know, he hasn't really put the puck in the back of the net. But that guy's got a motor. Uh, he's got speed, and that's certainly a big element of that of the bottom lines for the Jets. You know, Morgan Barron was the team's fastest skater at their skills competition. He's got speed. Axel, when he's in there, I uh, was looking at through the edge stats. He was among the fastest players now he's he wasn't he's been kind of banged up here but uh when all those guys are going uh you know that is a speedy fourth line you need that get in the corners muck it up you know create turnovers create chances and kupari's you know it's nice to have him back in line really it really does bring that speed element you know one thing i wonder if we don't see down the row let's say mark shafley's out extended time us 
move Velarde or Perfetti to center and get Nino. Yeah. Uh, get Nino playing with some, you know, top six players. You know, I liked him with, you know, Lowry, if he's playing with Lowry and Appleton. But, um, you know, you're going to need to pick up some scoring from somewhere with Mark Shifley out as your top point getter. And I think Nino's a guy who can do that if he's playing with, you know, playing with some other players. So, well, I think that's something to watch for. We'll see, you know, it's for a game or two, go with this, and it doesn't work. I mean, they keep winning, so hey, you don't need to, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, but something to watch for, I think, long term. Yeah, you know, I think it's a, it's an interesting point, and who knows, that might be the case. Um, well, we'll see what happens tomorrow afternoon in Ottawa, if they can keep, uh, you know, get it two points and pull that in. But the hope is that Shifley will be back for Monday because – as I said, that's the soonest he could be back. He's not ruled out. And we, you know what? We'll hear from Bones in just a minute. Shout out to Dave Manuk of Illegal Curve uh, for grabbing uh, that audio down of practice today. Don't forget to start off your game day tomorrow with a little IC, 9 a.m. You know where to find it on the Illegal Tur- Curve YouTube channel uh, as well as on the podcast. Now, as far as last night goes, Reem, you know, it's funny because... All, you know, up until about the last two weeks, we'd sort of been just looking, well, what's Colorado doing? What's Dallas doing? And worrying about the Central Division. Now with this lofty spot that the Winnipeg Jets are in, we're looking at, well, what did Boston do? What did Vancouver do to stay on top of the entire league? And while Boston in the Central did the Jets a favor, beating the Avalanche and moving one up on the Winnipeg Jets, and the Canucks did the Jets a favor somewhat in the Central Division by beating the Coyotes, not that they're really in striking distance right now. Um, The Jets moved to third in the point standing, still number one in points percentage, and have that game tomorrow night. Uh, It was not a good night for the Central Division in uh, in the NHL standings. The Avalanche lose to the Bruins. The Wild gets smoked by the Lightning. Dallas got crushed by Philadelphia, 5-1 in Philly. The St. Louis Blues got pumped 5-2 by the uh, Washington Capitals. The Blackhawks, not that they're a major player right now, but they got shut out by the Sabres. And uh, the Predators were the lone team to get a win, and they did it at the expense of PLD and the Kings, who continue to struggle. Uh, So Nashville got a win, everybody else in the Central losing. And that's sort of where things shake down. And if you're watching with us on YouTube, again, the official standings right now on WST, today we recognize points percentage, and the Jets are still number one in points percentage. Uh, And, of course, they'll be going at it with Boston in that head-to-head matchup on Monday. Yeah, it's crazy how the Jets, and they've been off for a couple days. So, you know, they've played so many less games than everyone. 43 games, Colorado's played 46, Vancouver 45, Boston 44. And you go to the division here, and Dallas lost yesterday, which you said. Nashville, the only team in the Central to win. But look at this lead they have in the Central. Like, start polishing uh, the rafters for a Central Division banner, am I right? Just, we need the banner. We need uh, the banner. 62 we, we just point. missed it. And we just missed it mm-hmm. in 2018. A Central Division banner would be nice. And And, hey, we can start talking about... I guess the Western Conference banner is for winning the playoffs, right? Like, they don't give yeah. you one for they that. Don't give They'll you give one. you a president's trophy and one for winning your division. Um, but, hey, the fact of the matter is they're still ahead of the Colorado Avalanche and have three games in hand uh, and are five points ahead of the Dallas Stars with the game in hand. So that's crazy. definitely put themselves in a good spot. And that's a big, big win for Nashville as well. When you talk about Calgary losing last night, the other teams losing in the wild card race. And Nashville very quietly has been, um, you know, one of the better teams in the National Hockey League uh, since early on in the season. Um, listen, Billick's going to come up right away. You want to just quickly drop this uh, Bones uh, update sure. from uh, from practice courtesy of day before we bring in Scott? Yeah, so assembled media there. Mike McIntyre led off the scrum, and here he is with the update on Mark Shafley. You know Mark Shifley today. Does that rule him out for tomorrow? It does. Um, we're going to reevaluate him on Monday. So he's making progress with this thing. Uh, clearly, it's gone on a little longer than we had originally thought. So that's fine. Um, that's all part of it. So we'll see where he is on Monday. He'll be traveling though with you guys. The team. Um, 
is obviously you don't want to rush anyone back, and um, so you, you'll you'll obviously err on the side of uh, being as cautious as. Yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, there we go. There's Rick Bonus on uh, Mark Shifley's status for um, for the road trip. No 55 tomorrow. Not ruled out for Monday, and uh, as I said, that's a big game against Boston, particularly when we're talking about this battle for the top of the league standings. Um, so we'll stay on top of that over the course of the weekend and have the latest for you on Monday's edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk coming up at noon. Um, let's, uh, just before we bring in Billick, give a big cheers to our friends at Canadian Club. Hey, stay tuned to Winnipeg Sports Talk over the next uh, week or so. We're going to have an exclusive opportunity to join us at a uh, a special Winnipeg Whiskey Festival event at the Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame. A very limited number of tickets, uh, but really looking forward to doing that. So, um, you know, and of course, Canadian Club, proud sponsor of the Winnipeg Whiskey Festival. If you've never been to it before, it is an unbelievable event coming up at the end of February. So we'll keep you... Uh, keep you up to tabs on that. And, of course, pop by your local Manitoba Liquor Marts this weekend. Get all the Canadian Club favorites, the uh, original CC 100% rye and Canadian Classic 12-year-old. And keep your eyes out for limited availabilities remaining of the Canadian Club Invitation Series 15-year-old Sherry Cask. And, hey, this weekend and always, don't forget to please enjoy responsibly. Um, it's about time for me, I think, to go back to Modern Man. I'll be working on that on the weekend or early next week. Um, folks, if uh, you need to need to look good, uh, get down to uh, one of eight locations uh, in Winnipeg for Modern Man, including the new locations on Pemina Highway or Plessy Road. Modern Man has you covered with everything you need, including great haircuts, beard shaping, shaves, color services, and more. Uh, make an appointment and book your look. Super easy. Just get on to modernmanbarber.com and give them a follow on Instagram as well at Modern Man Barbershops. Uh, we're in the thick of it right now, and the Jets are building and raising everybody's spirits that are usually down a little bit when it's this cold outside in the middle of winter. But um, the one thing that will get your spirits down is if your damn car won't start. We've seen that happen in the city over the last few days. Make sure you are good to go. And Manitoba Batteries got you covered. If you need a new battery for your car or truck right now, shop local, get the best prices in town. And better yet, you won't even have to leave your home because Donnie and the gang are going to deliver that battery to you for free anywhere inside the perimeter with any purchase over 60 bucks. It's just that easy. And stay tuned to Winnipeg Sports Talk because... Big news for Manitoba Battery. They're opening up a second location in the south end of the city on Dover Court next month. We'll have grand opening specials and sale information heading into it and uh, wish them well. And, of course, they're very thankful for the WST support from our listeners. Uh, definitely one of our most popular sponsors when they go in and deal with Manitoba Battery. Again, for all your battery needs right now during the deep freeze, manitobabattery.com. Give them a call at 783-8787. And for now, they're one location in Winnipeg, 1026 Logan Avenue. All right, let's get Billick in here and uh, look ahead to this road trip. Scotty, what's going on? How are you? Oh, and, uh, so I was just uh, thinking when you were talking about Manitoba Battery there, uh, shout out to Manitoba Battery. But um, I was reading this Reddit post yesterday. Pretty funny, this guy bought a car, he's like, it's like minus like whatever it is at night now. He's like, oh, I don't think I have a block heater. And it's like, he was like, yeah, well, you know, should I get a block heater? And everybody's like, yeah, duh. Like, yeah, of course. Right. So Donnie and then the boys there, Manto battery might be getting a, a customer looking with their new car and then their, <laughs> and their freshly dead battery from not buying a block heater with their car. I always thought like block heater was just like mandatory or just something that, that, that cars had when they were up here. But anyways, this guy obviously doesn't have one and may have a dead battery in his brand new car. So that sounds anyways, like that's a significant issue. That's a significant <laughs> issue like, right now. It sounds like you're, a, uh, a possible <laughs> fatal error. Yes. Yeah. At some point. So if yeah. you're, uh, if you're into it, um, the uh, we were just kind of going down the uh, the list of um, the uh, games last night. A busy night in the National Hockey League. Uh, Leafs yeah. finally got a big win uh, yeah. against Calgary. <clears throat> Hated that overruled goal in the third period on the uh, the quote unquote hand pass. But I mean that is sort of the way the rule is right now. So I guess yeah. they technically got it right. 
not sure that's the spirit of the rule. Um, but man, I mean, everybody else in the central kind of falling back and it's been so much fun kind of following Boston and Vancouver going head to head for the top of the division. But as Remus just pointed out, you know, the way the team has played and a few other teams having the odd off night. I mean, the Jets have not only established themselves as the number one team in the central division, but have given them a nice gap over Dallas and still are ahead of Colorado and with three games in hand. I mean, this opportunity going into some tough games this uh, this next week, Scott, um, no. a chance for the Jets to, you know, hopefully put in a few more wins, really be feeling good about where they're at, but also giving themselves a, a nice cushion because we talked about how important it could be to be number one in the Central and potentially number one in the West because I do think that that second wildcard team is going to be a real step below, in all likelihood, the fourth place team in the Pacific Division, which likely, well, unless the Kings just don't get their act together, but will likely be the first wild card. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing here is you don't want to be the second place or third place team in this division, right? Exactly. I mean, you, you look, you look at this. Like, do you want to play Colorado or do you want to play Dallas in the first round? And that's probably neither, right? I think if you had to say it, you want to start your playoffs, and I don't, I want to call it the easier matchup but you'd rather ease yourself a little bit into the playoffs rather than going against uh, you know, the, the, the Stanley Cup champs from two years ago or a Dallas team that's also had this team's number this year and plays a really demanding game. Like That's, that's a second-round matchup that you'd, you'd rather have than a first-round matchup. That being said, yeah, I mean, I, I think this is what it is, right? Like You have these three games in hand on Colorado. Dallas Stars have only won five of their last ten, so they floundered a little bit. Um, yeah, you want to create some separation. And, and it's the thing is Colorado is still a good team. You know, they have some injuries, but they, it's possible that they get better, especially by playoff time. And, and it's looking at this point that the Avs are going to get like a Gabriel Landeskog back um, potentially by the playoffs, right? And so, yeah, I mean, you, you need to create that separation, which the Jets have done a good job of this year, right? Like they're on top of the division, as you said, with three games in hand on on the on the abs and and I think they have one game in hand on on Dallas right now. Yeah, um, and a five point cushion. And a five point cushion, right? And you know this is a this is the funny thing. I was I was looking at this before I came on. You look at the the Edmonton Oilers. They've won twelve straight, right? They're still eleven points behind the Jets in in the Western Conference standings. I'd say. So they've obviously made this huge rise up where they started, but you can see like you win. Tw- 12 straight games, it only puts you third in the conference. You're tied while well, you're, you're one point ahead of the, the Los Angeles Kings who've won just one game in the last 10 games themselves, which is an insane thing given where we thought the Kings would be and how they started this season, how they beat the Jets so handily early on in the year, and the Kings have just kind of plummeted, right? Um, so it's interesting to see, but this is where you your points that you stack up in the first, and we talk about the the American Thanksgiving and the Christmas break and, and the player break, the all-star break, whatever of these kind of, um, I don't know if you call them milestones, but like the, these posts that you pass and you want to just keep stacking points. And this is the importance of stacking points early. Cause I mean, obviously the Oilers have, have gone on this ridiculous record run. It's a record run, which is also insane sidebar insane that the teams have passed Oilers teams, which are absolutely insane. Gretzky and Messier and Curry and all those guys, right, didn't win. I think they they never won 10 straight. Um, I think this is just a continuing right? It might be 11. Anyways, don't quote me on that. But the point is, it's so hard to gain points. It's so hard to catch up. And so you have to go on this ridiculous run of games. Well, here we are where the Jets have gone on a ridiculous run, um, but have, have been so consistent all year that they, they, they sit up top, their best in points percentage in the league still, if I'm not mistaken, and and they're the best team in the Central right now. Um, and so they have this sort of buffer or cushion or whatever you want to call it. Um, but I think we what we've seen from this Jets team, and I think they be, can become the second team tomorrow in the league to win 30 games this year, is that they, they don't they don't take the foot off the gas pedal. And so, yeah, like I think there is, especially against Ottawa, you need to go into Ottawa and win that game. But you, you've shown that you can go with Boston. And you've shown, while we haven't seen the Leafs yet, but we can we know what the Leafs are. And and at any point in the game, you can come back against the Toronto Maple Leafs right now. No lead, no lead is safe in the six. Let's just say that. Um, but yeah, like I I think that 
the Jets have, have bought themselves a lot of goodwill, a lot of, um, but they they bought themselves some. I don't know how to call it a cushion or some time. I I don't know what the, maybe the word is right now for it, but they they put themselves in a really good position here to not just be this team that's you know flirting with the top or you know going back and forth. Like they can really put some, especially going into the player break. You know, you stack three wins here on the road as we've seen them be able to do here uh, in the past and, and you're on 67 points and still going to have those games in hand, still going to have some other things going on here and, and in real good position um, to, I mean, I think you guys were talking about hanging a banner um, and, and all that stuff earlier, but in a good position just to, to, to tackle, like, I don't know you want to call it the second half of the season, but the, the stretch run into the playoffs in a really good spot where they can just keep it going and, and feel comfortable and not have to worry like last year. The exact so opposite of last year where Hellebuck exactly. has to play the last 13 games yeah. of the season. Um, exactly. And yeah, yeah, I mean, listen, the batter would be nice. I mean, does it mean anything Nothing. for, you know, yeah. the, the playoffs? Well, yeah. it does though, because uh, to your point, sure. yeah. like at Hell, I'd be way rather play one of the two wildcard teams than either Dallas or Colorado and let those I, I teams agree. beat the hell yeah. out of each other for seven games in the first round. Um, and hopefully, you know, like the Jets did in 17, 18 against Minnesota, move quickly through that first round. And again, we're getting way, way ahead of ourselves, but yeah. um, you know, it's but more than... advantage and all those things are important, right? Totally, You'd like totally. to have that. Yeah. You know what, but you know, you just mentioned Edmonton. So like Edmonton, their last 10, we'll just focus on their last 10. They are 10 and 0. Yeah. They've made up two points on the Winnipeg Jets, <laughs> which is that's crazy, right? Like, and this again, like I mean, I don't want to belabor the point, but it's so hard to make up spots, and that's why the Jets. I mean, the pressure is still there to win, right? Because the more you win, obviously, the harder you are to, to catch, and you can just see like it's it's difficult. Can can you know? We're asking a question right now. Like, could the could the Dallas Stars? I mean is a crazy thing to say because the Dallas Stars still have 40 games well 38 games left in the season but a five-point lead is is a tough that's a tough thing to make up right and obviously they're going to play themselves as a divisional so that'll be a little easier you know if Dallas can, can win a couple of games against the Jets to close out the year to make it up but it is so difficult to yeah stack points or not even stack point but catch up to teams now and 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 and, and if you're going to do it you literally have to win 10 straight, 12 straight, whatever it is. Like that's, that's what it is. So the Jets are in a really good spot right now. Like until, I mean, that's, until the the three point games are added into the, uh, yeah. until every game is worth three points um, and it's three points for a win, you know, making up big ground without just winning every single game is, yeah, uh, is, is yeah. really, really tough. Um, What, um, I, I, so I guess Helly's going to go tomorrow. How do you, um, how do you see the goaltending go this week? Is LB go in that's, Boston on Monday? That's a weird one, right? So here's the, the weird thing we were talking about this morning. It's like, okay, so they have this, this record that they're chasing right now. They're at 33. The record's 35 for three goals or fewer. I think that I think the two goals or fewer are somewhere around 18. I'm still waiting back from the league to, to get that to get an idea. But anyways, that record's not 21 straight, two goals or less in regulation. Is it 21? So yeah, well, no, in, in regulation. Oh. Just in because regulation. that Montreal game, like you have to go Sorry, all the yeah. way back to November 30th against the Oilers. Yeah. Um, and that yeah. third goal was uh, was an empty netter, as yeah. we all remember. But I, I do, like, I mean, Rick Bonus said this morning that they want to get Brassois, and I, I believe he said this morning that it was Hellbuck that'll play tomorrow. That's not surprising. I mean, given the fact that there's been some time off and they're only going to play five games or four games now, I think in the next 19 nights or 18 nights or something like that. There's not a lot of hockey. So, you know, they're going to play Hellebuck, but you know, he did say that LB would play on one of these games. To me, it's probably Boston, you know, like I, I just, I wonder if, if it's Boston and only because, well, the record won't be on the line there. I think, you know, because the jets can, if they keep this going, right, they can, they can, break the record against Toronto at home next Saturday, if I'm not mistaken. So they have to win three to tie it right now, or two to tie it. So maybe they can do it actually on, on Monday then in, uh, is it Monday? Yeah, I believe it's Monday in uh, against the Leafs. No, Wednesday against the Leafs. Yeah. Um, but so I think they can do it there. Uh, that's when they, so they'll tie the record, could tie the record against the Bruins, and then 
and break it. So I think they would probably have Hellebuck in net against the Leafs that night. But, you know, I guess it's just going to depend, right? Like, I mean, we'll see. We'll see what uh, – I don't always believe that they'll play LB just because – there's two days in between each of these games and, you know, to the back half of these games, like it sounds like from base where bonus said is like, I'd figure, you know, Bersois, if you played tomorrow, that make some sense because you're playing the lesser team of the other three, other two that you're playing on this road trip. But yeah, I mean, they, they, I, they trust Lauren Bersois, right? Like, I mean, they put him in against some teams, some tough teams. Um, he's played well. And I don't think the, the, the goaltending, I don't want to say the goaltending doesn't dip. It does a little bit, right? I mean, we're talking about one guy who is the clear front runner for the Vesna right now, and then we're talking about another guy who, you know, had you know, he's played very well. Scott, well, but Scott it's not let's the same, let's but. look let's look at the numbers. I got him right in front oh, of no, me. Oh no, the numbers are very Hellebuck, similar. Hellebuck, two nineteen goals against average, nine twenty five save percentage. Yeah. LB's got a 218 goals against average and a 923 save percentage. Yeah, I mean, they're basically. The games, but yeah. Like, but I mean, yes, you're right. But when they've yeah. been in, and I mean, let's not forget, neither of those guys had great starts. Like, oh, I don't no. know what their numbers are from the start of November on, but you're oh, probably looking at well into like 935, 940 save percentages and goals against averages of two or less, which. Yeah. Is credit to them, but also credit to the team. But as far as Brassois goes, I mean, I, I've got full confidence that he'll go in and play well yep. night in and night out. And listen, at some point, these guys are going to have off nights. I mean, I think it is unrealistic to think that this is what you're going to get every yeah. single game for 82 or, well, for the remaining 40 or 38 or whatever the Jets have to play. Um, but again, a big part of it is the way that they're doing it. But they have to do it without Mark Shifley. And you know, yeah. you would love, you would love. I know for a fact, Shife is going to do everything he can to play in that game against Toronto, in Toronto, and then back here in Winnipeg. To me, the question is: Is this just one more game of being cautious with Shifley and bring him back for a big game against Boston, which likely will be again jockeying for that number one spot in the entire league, um, or? Is he just simply not cleared yet, and it'll be a stretch to try to get him into that game Wednesday night in T.O.? I think they're not going to rush him. I think that's what we know about this team is they won't rush him, even if it is that T.O. game. Um, you're gonna, still going to get the Maple Leafs on Hockey Night in Canada uh, on sa- on the Saturday, right? So it's not like not like you're you're going to you're going to miss out on 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 playing the Leafs. That said, those Toronto games are big games for a lot of these guys because a lot of them hail from Ontario. It's just like the Detroit game, right? Even though, you know, Detroit's in the, you know, obviously in the U.S., there's a ton of people that come to those Detroit games from Canada, from Southern Ontario, uh, to cheer on their kids and their and, and their friends and whatever it is, right? So, Not to mention yeah, all the Michigan guys a, on the Jets. Uh, well, exactly. And that's the other thing. They come up for the Toronto game, you know? So that's the thing. Like, it, 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 those are big games for a lot of those guys. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that, yeah, if Mark can play, he will. But, I mean, it, it almost seemed this morning that, that the way that Bonus kind of said it, just like the recovery hasn't happened. And, you know, I, I believe it's a groin injury with, with Shifley. And so these are those types of injuries that it, it, they're just, they're really difficult to predict, right? Like when a guy's going to come back. Um, they're really difficult to predict kind of a, uh, how the recovery is going to go. And, and he hasn't been skating. So that's the other thing here is like, it's not ready for him to skate on. Does that change on Sunday? I don't know. Does he skate in the morning, skate tomorrow, and just kind of do whatever? Like, that. this is the thing. Like, because we know it's a lower body injury, because we know that it's a anywhere from, you know, it's some sort of leg, groin, hip, whatever it might be, hamstring, whatever. I don't, We don't know exactly, but I'm, I'm fairly, fairly confident it's a groin injury. Um you know, it, it, it's just one of those things where it has to feel right. Then you got to skate on it. Then you got to wait till the next morning to make sure it still feels right. And then you got to, then you can go. Because one thing we know about the groin injuries, and we look back to Nikolai Ehlers this last year, um, I mean, he obviously had a groin injury and then turned into a sports hernia thing or whatever. I don't know how those things work. But uh, again, you just don't want to aggravate it. You don't want to make it worse. And you don't want Shifley out for longer than it needs to be. I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, I don't want to raise alarms here or anything, but I, with only four games left till the break, I mean, if the Jets are doing well without him, 
and 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 winning games and there's no reason to real kind of really rush it or even think about putting him in a little bit earlier than you need to um you might just take that extra time given what you've kind of built up they do and have a luxury to do that but i know they the do. Player... I, i'm not saying that's the right way or that's the, what they're going yeah. to do but again you got to be thinking long term here right i mean this is this is again i mean we're still just past the midway point of the season you don't want to jeopardize anything here and if it's a groin injury we know that these sort of things can be uh finicky let's say he's too important and i think you know will they'll they'll uh entertain his wishes but at the same time lean yeah. on the doctors for the uh, for the final call yeah. um but I, I will say this he's just so important i mean it, it's tough to imagine like can you go in and beat the boston bruins in boston without mark shifley um, credit to the guys that are getting it done. I mean, hey, they just beat the New York Islanders. They'll have a chance to do it tomorrow against Ottawa. But you would like to see the full complement of Winnipeg Jets going up in a game that could very well be for the number one spot in the league. A couple yeah. things in chat. Uh, big hitter says, uh, says, we don't want the Oilers in the playoffs. I disagree. Uh, you definitely want the Oilers in the playoffs because where they're at right now, they're going to be in the top three. And if you end up playing the Oilers in the playoffs, that's going to be in the Western Conference Finals. So um, you're going to have to go through <laughs> sure. some good teams to do that. Um, but Phil is bringing up the uh, Bruce Garriock report about Jacob Chikrin. Let's talk about that because, again, we're getting closer to Yep. Things really heating up on the trade market. I think it's pretty clear that the Winnipeg Jets have put themselves in a position where the general manager and the organization will feel that this is maybe more than ever before a time to be aggressive, to try to do everything you can to uh, to you know up your team. Chikrin has one more year on his contract, and it sounds like you know things have soured a little bit in Ottawa, and it's been a miserable season for that yeah. group. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, the Jets' interest in Chikorin, and what do you think it would take to get him out of Ottawa? Yeah, I mean, not the first time they've had interest in Chikorin. They had interest in him last year too, right? I mean, and that's you know part of the thing. I, I think the weird, the, it, it's an interesting thing with Chikorin because because of the having the one year extra. Obviously, this team has always loved term. Um, but right now, you're also trying to re-sign potentially both of your defense in there. You still uh, and and Brendan Dillon and Dylan Demello. Um, obviously, you've got Nate Schmidt there, and I'm not sure that's a movable contract. It might be a buyout contract. I'm not sure the Jets are going to go that route again. Um, they would have, I mean, I think five million at least next year then in dead cap space that they'd have to account for, and you don't want to be doing that, even though the cap is going up four million or whatever it is. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I think it's the right thing. I think you've got to kick the tires on 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 a guy like Jacob Chicken. Uh, and what is it going to get done? Probably a first round pick. Um, you know, I think I think the Jets will probably be fine with spending that on the right on the right player this year. I mean, I think they've they've done really well in the last couple of drafts with Barlow, McGrory, and guys like that. Um, and and at this time of the year, you want to get better. Oftentimes, it starts with a first round guy. Do I think that's the right option? I'm not entirely sure. Um, you know, is Chickering the third pairing guy that you need? Yeah, he can play both sides of the ice. That's great. Um, you know, could you get better with a guy like Chris Tanev instead, who who's a little more rugged? I was just going to ask you and, about Tanev. Like, who would well, you prefer? Well, and that's the thing. Like, I wonder, and what's the cost? Because he is an expiring, uh, expiring. He's an contract expiring deal, and I think he's going to be too. Like, does he though fit? I'll have a story coming in the next couple of days on this and, and, and what players want. And, and even though this team has chemistry and, and all that, and they want to make sure the right guys come in, make no mistake, the players in that room want this team to add at the deadline, right? Like, I mean, we have this talk about, oh, you know, could this team just kind of stand pat and listen to 32 Thoughts today and talking about, they're talking to Brian Burke about, all oh, the only person he had in 2007 when the Ducks won was Brad May. And they went on to win and all that, but I, but I think at the end of the day, like there, there is an excitement in the players when a player gets added because that means that the team that you're playing for, that you've done well for, to get to this point, that team has invested in the team and sort of kind of reinvigorates everybody. Um, it, it gets everybody excited about the next month or two uh, of, of the playoff run and all that sort of thing. So. 
I, I think that I, I, I'm very certain that the, the Jets want some investment here, um, or the, the players at least want some investment here, and they're willing to, you know, obviously, you know, bring in the right players. And I think the assimilation process will be the, the, that wouldn't be be an issue. I think the culture on this team is is in a place right now that they can accept that. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I think you know, I think the chicken thing's interesting. I, I think we're going to hear the Jets in in a lot of conversations right now. I think we know that they're looking at uh, Sean Monahan uh, as potentially a, an, a, an option at center. Um, you're, you're looking at potentially a Sean Walker, who is a right shot defenseman out of Philly. Is Philly looking to sell a guy like that? Um, I don't know because the Philadelphia Flyers are doing pretty good right now, and 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 so that's the other thing. Like, what what are some of these other teams that we thought would be rebuilding that is turned into contending teams, or at least playoff contenders? At least are they going to be so willing to sell anymore? Uh, you know, a guy like Sean Walker, who might be more of a depth defenseman. Add one thing that we've heard about this team is they're looking at depth defenseman. I'm not sure is Jacob Chicken a depth. I'm not trying to pour water on Jacob Chicken. I think he'd be a great ad. Don't get me wrong. I just I'm not entirely sure it fits with what this team is at least said to be doing. But at the same time, if you're looking to find a guy that that might be the best guy out there, um, at least available right now, and a defensive guy can play both sides, versatile. Rick Bonus likes that. That might be a guy like Chickering. And what does it cost? I mean, I think Billy Heinle is in that. So I mean, I think I think Jets fans have to understand that. You know, you, you hear about some of these prospects, and I think there's going to be two guys that would probably be untouchable right now in the pro- – well, three, Delmanson, Barlow, and McGroarty. Then you got to be willing to be – everybody's in play other than that, right? And so it's not just – you're not trading Logan Stanley for Jacob Chickren, right? You're not trading Logan Stanley in a fifth for Jacob Chickren. Like, you're probably trading a first-round pick and maybe even Billy Hainala. Well, yeah, your, your prospect needs to be better. To your prospect it. needs to be better because Agreed. let's face it, this team's number one right now. If this team makes a yeah. deep, deep run in the playoffs, yeah, even if you I just agree. get to the conference finals, you're yeah. talking about a pick that's 29, 30, 31, or 30 second. Yeah. So it's not, so, it's not, it's, it's basically, yeah, it's a fringe second round pick almost, right? I mean, I get that it's going to be there, but I mean, the Ottawa's got to be okay, comfortable with the fact, just like you said, it could be 30, 31, or even 30. 32 of and and again at that point you don't care about Vili Hanel or anybody like that if you're a fan if you're hanging on an actual Stanley Cup banner um but at the same time that's what the prices are and don't give me like Jacob Chicken is going to be an in-demand defenseman for teams that are looking for defensive help and so the Jets are going to not just have to be in on it they're going to have to be well, I, first of all I think Chicken has a 10 team no trade clause I don't think that Chicken would say no to coming to the Jets that's the other thing that you got to I mean, again, winning changes a lot of things, right? You'll go to Winnipeg for wherever, even if it's for an extra year after this one, if you think you got a chance to win. I think the reason why Chicken went to Ottawa at the, in the beginning was because he figured they had a chance to win, and they were on the up and up, right? And so, um, but yeah, I, you know, I think it's it's definitely something that the Jets should be kicking the tires on. Um, I think it's just you got to be willing to pay what the price is going to be for that, and. You know, I think the price is probably going to stun a few people that may not want to give up that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, if you want to be in the conversation for these big name guys, the guys that are on the top of these trade bait lists and all that, you got to be willing to put in there first and then put in one of your better prospects. And if you're a team like Ottawa, you'd be looking at Billy and being like, yeah, I want that guy. And, and, and especially, I mean, with a guy like, listen, if they're trading Chickren, hmm. who they got because he had two years left of term and they gave up a high pick and some other stuff to get him. Yeah. Um, you know, you're 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 wanting that back. And we're going to yeah. talk to Alex Adams in a second in Ottawa about kind of the situation around the Sens. I mean, for me, I, I think the way the Winnipeg Jets project into next year I think it's probably makes more sense in the short term to go for Tanev, who doesn't have that that term uh, on it because you know you'll have a Salmon son who you know you're going to need to come in and have a couple guys on ELCs and they have those opportunities of guys like he and Rucker that should be able to challenge for spots in the lineup next year if a player like Vili Hainala goes knowing that Nate Schmidt has one more year in his contract and that's not just going to be a sunk cost. And frankly, the guy's played well enough. I know, is he overpaid by NHL standards? Yeah, that often happens oh, at the, the end. Yeah. 
But UB has been great. awesome. Yeah. They've been getting the job done, and you can handle that if you've got a couple players on ELCs. And the other guy, I've never been big on Monaghan, and at the start when I was thinking about this, I didn't even give it much thought. But the thing about Monaghan is... Uh, big time. We know how important that is to Rick Bonus. We know how poor the Winnipeg Jets are as far as teams in the playoffs right now. I believe they're rated last of the teams that are in a playoff spot yeah. right now. And the other thing is, he's on an expiring contract. He makes less than $2 million. He's a player that you can probably get. Like, listen, they're not going to trade a first rounder for, for Monaghan. I know that's what right. Montreal's floating out. Uh, but who knows? Maybe the Habs getting their own second rounder back that yeah. the Jets got in uh, in the L.A. trade and a lesser prospect, maybe that gets it done. And because of the cap space the Jets have, unlike most of the other contenders, and the fact that his salary is less than $2 million, that might open up a window where you could do a Monaghan and a Tanev and really make uh, really make a yeah. big push. It sh- you know, listen, it's going to be... It's going to be very, very interesting, and those conversations, I think, are really going to heat up post-All-Star break on the program and, of course, in the Winnipeg Sun. Scotty, enjoy. Uh, quickly, before we go, who you got, Ch- Chiefs or Bills? Oh, Huss, I hate to do this to you, but I think the Bills, have, this feels this feels to me like Indianapolis and the Patriots back in, I want to say it was 2006, where, like, the Colts just finally, you knew it was coming, right? Like, you knew the Colts are going to beat my Pats, and it just happened, and it was whatever, right? Like, I, I, I think because, too, that this is the first time it's at Orchard Park, right? Like, yeah. this isn't, you, you can't just drive to Orchard Park. Maybe you are. Maybe you are going to drive all the way out there. Flight I don't to know. Toronto. Maybe you're flying. Flight to Toronto. Are you going? No, no, no. You're no, totally I'm not going, going. <laughs> No, I, I was yeah, looking I, at it. I wasn't even back. I was on the way back from KC looking at right. uh, a way to get there for the I'm game. I'm sure you were. Um, but uh, give me the bills. And I don't know. I just think it's – it's. I think we're seeing this as the year of the time where teams are starting to – there's been a lot of upsets, right? And I think, you know, the is, is the bills over the Chiefs a huge upset? I'm not entirely sure. You would well, probably they're favored. It would they're, be. They're the yeah. favorite right now. This is basically a pick em and they're getting the home field advantage. So Yeah. So, and, but uh, here's the thing, like, I, I don't think there's, I mean, obviously there's a home field advantage, but this isn't like, this isn't like Miami coming into wherever, right. And playing and just, well, Miami, well, it was Buffalo, right. Miami coming into Buffalo. Who did, who did played in Buffalo last week? Was it oh, Miami? It was the Steelers. The, the Steelers. Mi- Mi- Miami came into minus 30. Yeah. In, that's uh, what I mean. in Kansas city. And you just can't, and it, right. Sorry. Yeah. And you just like, I mean, yeah, that is home field advantage, but, but, but I think that, you know, we all know, well, you will know exactly how cold Arrowhead is, and we all know what Buffalo is like. So, yeah, I, I, I slight edge to Buffalo because they're home team. But, I mean, I, I'm never going to take anything away from the Chiefs because the thing is the Chiefs, they've been there, right? And that's, at the end of the day, that's, you know, they're, they're Super Bowl champions for a reason, man. And, and, and well, so, and, and Josh Allen's got to get over it, and he's got he's to win the game. He did a hell of a job last week in winning the Bills that game, put on a heck of a performance. He's just not as consistent as Pat Mahomes. So, so right, he's got to come in and do it. One, eight and one is an underdog as well. We're going to get to this in a little later on. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the game tomorrow afternoon and then all the football. And then we'll catch up next week. There's Scotty Billick from the Winnipeg Sun. All right, we're going to actually head to Ottawa. Uh, right now or in just a second uh, to get the latest on uh, a pretty miserable season for the Senators considering the expectations but some interesting names being floated out as potential trade targets for teams including the Winnipeg Jets we will remind you while we're talking Jets next Saturday a week tomorrow Leafs in town if you can grab a ticket for that do it it should be bananas in that building and then a couple weeks afterwards Jets back against Sidney Crosby and the Pittsburgh Penguins with a big Saturday night, nothing better than uh, than Saturday night hockey on uh, the uh, the big stage against some of the top teams. And again, still opportunities to get in on ticket packages for the remainder of this season, and lock yourself in ahead of the general public for playoff tickets. And of course, hopefully, keep you on board for next year and get that season ticket base back up to where we need it to be. Uh, WinnipegJets.com/tickets availability for the upcoming games. And they would love to talk to you about getting you, friends, or if you're with a company, getting you into some season tickets for the rest of this season for a first-place hockey club and hopefully what will be a long playoff run. All available now at winnipegjets.com. Uh, we got to give a thanks to our friends at Wallace & Wallace. 
the fencing and overhead door specialists in Winnipeg since 1946. Of course, you've seen their fences and trucks all over the city, uh, but you might not be aware of how many Winnipeg homes have uh, enjoyed overhead doors, both sales and service from Wallace & Wallace as the Clopay dealer in Manitoba with the largest selection for your home. Uh, but right now, we're into the coldest part of the year, and this is what puts the most stress on your garage door over 12 months. The right time to prevent downtime this winter is now. Give Wallace & Wallace a call to book your inspection and maintenance service call today for residential and commercial overhead door sales and service. There's only one name or two you need to know, and that is Wallace and & Wallace. And uh, planning on getting down to F Apparel next week and fit it out for some new duds. Going to get Connor down there and get a suit for him as well. Uh, because, of course, guys, if you're looking to up your menswear game, there is really only one place to go, and that is F Apparel at 190 Smith Street downtown. Custom suits beginning at 400 bucks, along with chinos, golf pants, custom shirts, both tucked and untucked styles, and an incredible selection of menswear accessories you won't find anywhere else. If you are getting hitched this year in a wedding party, make sure to talk to the guys at F as well about a 15% discount when the wedding party gets their suits from F Apparel. 190 Smith Street downtown. Find out more information or make an appointment online at F. That's ephapparel.com. All right. Let's welcome in our old pal Alex Adams, who uh, we spent a lot of time talking hoops at the FIBA World Cup. But Alex has been busy covering the Ottawa Senators this year out in the nation's capital. And uh, Alex, I must say, uh, this has probably been quite the experience for you covering this team because it's been such a disappointing year. Hopes were so high for Ottawa. And um, man, it just has not gone the way that things were expected. There's been coaching changes, management changes. But unfortunately, despite a win last night, it hasn't really turned around on the ice. Yeah, no, it's been a, a really, really tough year for the Ottawa Senators. It's almost like the complete opposite of the Winnipeg Jets, a team that I, I follow very near and dear to my heart with my husband working for the team. So, yeah, everything's gone wrong. They haven't got goaltending. They've been a mess in their own zone. Uh, Dorian gets mutually fired, essentially, uh, because of uh, a scandal involving the Evgeny Dadanov trade. Uh, obviously, DJ Smith got fired as well. And now the Sens actually have a worse winning percentage with Jacques Martin compared to DJ Smith. So it's just been a roller coaster of a, a season. Um, and yeah, it's it's a mess. And uh, yeah, it's going to be an interesting matchup just because uh, against the Jets, just because the, the two teams are almost polar opposites in every single way. Uh, Sens have the worst save per, team save percentage in the league. The Jets have the best. So um, that's kind of shows a, a lot about the two teams. Well, speaking of save percentage, I mean, you know, that uh, there's a lot of places to kind of pick apart where things have gone wrong. Um, but, you know, they forked out that that contract to Corpus Allo, um, who's got a 363 goals against average and an 885 save percentage. And it's easy to put it all on the goaltender, and certainly they'll have a big, big role in it. But we've seen how much the Jet goaltenders have benefited from the way the team is playing in front of them night in and night out. And I imagine that those ugly numbers for both Corpus Allo and Forsberg and Sogard, every goalie that's played, is also um, you know a bit of the state of the union, if you if it will, about a young team that just hasn't really learned what it takes to uh, help your goaltender out to give yourself the best chance to win night in and night out. Yeah, the best way maybe to describe this team, and, and it, we've been talking about it and asking the players and, and coaches this question is, are you fragile? Is this team fragile? Because they've given up 14, uh, they've lost 14 games this season after taking the lead at one point in the game, right? They've given up a bunch of goals and bunches. And yeah, the, the goaltending has been pretty subpar, but the players in front of them have been really bad. Um, and you can talk, oh, really, a lot of the blame can be on Pierre Doran because this team has very few defensive-minded forwards, uh, if you look at the Jets outside of maybe Shifley, Connor, there's you know most players are pretty good defensively, and look how great they've been playing as a as a unit. If you look at the Sens outside of maybe Matthew Joseph, uh, Stusla, Kachuk, Batherson are all over the place in their own end, and and you can see it on the ice. They give grade A chance after grade A chance, and um, they've been you know every time they've actually needed a save, even. Um, in the big moments, they haven't been getting it. And uh, it's just been a roller coaster of 
essentially everything going wrong at the wrong time. And uh, obviously they won last night, but uh, overall um, it's just been a comedy of errors in almost every department, the power play, the penalty kill. Um, there's not really anything you can take a, a shining light of any player outside of maybe Ridley Gregg and Matthew Joseph this season for the team. Outside of those two players, everyone's been uh, underwhelming to incredibly underwhelming. You know, uh, obviously, uh, when uh, the puck drops tomorrow, we'll see a lot of Brady Kachuk. We'll see a lot of Tim Stutzel. Um, they have a very, very young leadership core. How much has all the losing um, impacted those players, and, and how are they dealing with it? Because I can't imagine it's easy. They, with the expectations, it's one thing that happened the last few years, but this gets old real fast, especially when people were expecting so much more. Yeah, it's it's a great question. I would say the the first thing is they really love DJ Smith. And I think since his departure, not anything against Jacques Martin, but you can tell that they, you know, even weeks after they referenced DJ and how awesome it was to be coached by him, he was really a player's coach. And obviously they didn't do a lot of winning under DJ Smith, but um, you can tell in the room that uh, things are down and, and, and everything. I wouldn't say that the room's particularly low, especially with, Stutzla and um, Kachuk as if you, I mean, they're obviously frustrated. I wouldn't say more so than anyone else when a team's losing. I wouldn't, I don't see anything kind of outlandish on that behalf, but yeah, it's really affected them of course. And um, you can really see that they're a young team because um, they just don't have that resiliency. You look at other teams around the league. I think they're the sixth youngest team in the league. And a lot of those teams are Chicago, Anaheim, um, you look at Buffalo as well that hasn't been doing very well, very young team. So I think in the league now, you have to have a lot of guys that are veteran presences. And with this team outside of maybe Giroux, uh, everyone's essentially, and maybe Tarasenko, everyone's under 26. Look at Shabbat, Sanderson, Chikrin, Norris, Kachuk. The whole core is actually relatively young. And I think that's really had an effect. And, and you can see it out on the ice because uh, they just have been immature would probably be a good way to describe the, their play on the ice so far this season. Yeah, I mean, the only guys over 30 on the team are Giroux, Tarasenko, who's actually been pretty productive. And um, yep. of course, um, uh, St. Mel's uh, Travis Hamannick, um, mm -hmm. a guy that sort of has been on the radar of the Jets for a while has been Jacob Chikrin. We heard Gary Ock yep. um, drop the uh, report last night. That the Jets have been kicking tires and that maybe the, uh, you know, coming to Ottawa, just the losing has probably worn on Jacob Chikrin, and they're less confident that they'll have the ability to sign him long-term. How has his season been? And look, for people that have not had a chance to see him quite a bit, like what does he bring to a team? And if he was dealt, I mean, what sort of an asset would that be to a team like the Jets? Yeah, he's, he's had a poor season, I'd say, for his, you know, caliber of a player, you know, and what he'd bring to the Jets, he's a very, he has a really good shot. Just a really, really good one-timer, really good wrist shot. Um, I think, obviously, with Morrissey on PP1, but Chikrin would definitely slide into PP2 for the Jets. Um, he's pretty, he's very mobile, a good skater. I wouldn't say he's the best. You know, he's he's a bit turnover prone. Um, he hasn't been on the best pairings. He's been paired with Hamannick a fair bit, and now he's on the offside with um, Shabbat on the right side. So I don't think he's been put in the best positions to be as effective as he could be and if you put him in a rick bonus style i think his defensive numbers would be much better but um i would say like the whole team he's been underwhelming and i would also say that um in his own zone i wouldn't say he's you know has the most awareness i wouldn't say he's the quickest processor um but he has a lot of the raw intangibles that you you like and is definitely more of a probably an offensive defenseman than you would say bringing uh defensive stability but um look at everyone on this Jets team. So if he, he if he came into Winnipeg, I'm sure he'd thrive. Um, and I think he'd really help their offense from the blue line, which is something I know Rick Bonus really prioritizes is getting the defenseman out up into the play. And I think Chickwin would make a lot of sense in, 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 in Winnipeg. You know, um, you know, our old pal Dave Poulin is uh, now in the uh, yep. in the brass uh, working with Steve Steos, um, you know, running the club. And I think they're in a real um, evaluation mode right now. Um, but as we get closer to the deadline, assuming this team doesn't go on some sort of a tear and gets back into the mix, which is highly unlikely, 
there probably will be some moves. Um, Chickren is a guy that by most accounts, they really prioritize signing. Now, that can't happen until next year. So there's a major decision to make to see how realistic that that is because I think you're probably getting a much better return if you can trade him with a year left on his deal. We've kind of touched on Chickren, but when you look at the at the roster and from what you're hearing being there on the beat on a day-to-day basis, um, who are the most likely senators to hear their names in trade talks and potentially on the move as we get closer to the deadline? Uh, I think obviously, like just to talk about Chickering quickly, like what I've heard, and I, I wouldn't say they have any hard info, but what I've been hearing around is that he wants to be on a winner. And because the Sens have been so awful this season, and he obviously has one year left on his deal, the prospect of signing is really dependent on the Sens turning this around, uh, or at least feeling going into next year that they'd uh, be better. So um, I think with him, uh, you know, there's been some, some, Reports, I would say, out of Ottawa that he might want out. Um, I don't know about that, but it would make a bit of sense that, uh, you know, he he basically, I think for the Sens, um, if he tells them, I don't, I want to be on a winner, I don't want to be here, um, I could see that happening and I could see him being dealt. I would probably say that the most likely scenario is that they wait on Chicker until the off-season, off season, as you said, just to wait and see and really evaluate. Um, outside of that, uh, obviously Tarasenko comes to mind. He does have a no trade clause, but he had one in St. Louis and waived it to go to New York. So that would make some sense as well. Um, but they don't have a lot of guys on expiring contracts. Dominic Kubelik, I don't really think it's worth much, um, and hasn't been that good. So overall, um, I think what comes next for the Sens is do you trade a Norris, a Batherson, a guy that's signed long-term and really make more of a hockey trade and almost... I wouldn't say blow up this roster, but make major changes to the roster. But that's probably most likely an off-season decision rather than a decision at the trade deadline. Well, it should be uh, interesting tomorrow to see how this team looks. I mean, they got a nice win last night, um, you know, against a team playing on the second end of back-to-backs. But those those wins have not come in succession very often so far <laughs> this year. Although they get a chance to play the Jets without Mark Shifley. That being said, they have been so good, and, I mean, they're such a deep team right now. Definitely a tough, tough out. Uh, Alex, for folks that want more on the Sens uh, and everything else you're doing, fill people in on where they can get all your content these days. Uh, Thanks so much, Hust. Yeah, I'm writing for um, the Hockey News. I'm covering, uh, obviously, the Senators day in and day out, and then also I'm covering doing some PWHL uh, action. So uh, hopefully... How's that uh, been, by the way? How's that been, by the way? There's a lot of jealous people here seeing how... You know, the I was going to say, teams. Winnipeg like, needs to be the, the next expansion team. Uh, you know, they need to come out to, to, to Manitoba, honestly. It's, it's been awesome, and I think it would thrive in Winnipeg, but the players are amazing. Um, I talked to Ashton Bell, who has some, who's from uh, uh, Manitoba, and, and she said she goes out in the summers. Uh, I forget exactly where, um, in a small town in Manitoba. but uh, Delarine, little, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's it. That's it, yep. Yeah. And has a little hockey school in the summers. Um and uh, yeah, they've been great. The players are awesome. Carla McLeod is like the quote of a century. She will always give you stuff. So I'm very uh, thankful for her to make my stories quite easy uh, with her with her good quotes. So it's been awesome. And uh, yeah, I think Winnipeg has to be on the list just because it's such a hockey town. And uh, the hockey's been amazing. The crowds have been wonderful. It's a lot of little girls screaming for, you know, two and a half hours, which is pretty awesome too. So it, it's uh, been it, really awesome. Listen, it's great for the sport and uh, it's great for these women who, uh, you know, up until now we've sort of seen them in the world championships once a year and we've seen them in the Olympics. And then, um, you know, there hasn't been a place for them to really play and thrive. And uh, obviously it's, uh, it, it's just been phenomenal to see how well this has been received in all six of the markets, uh, but especially in Ottawa. Have a great weekend and enjoy the game tomorrow, pal. Thanks for doing this. Thanks so much for having me on, Huss. Good stuff. There's Alex Adams in Ottawa with the uh, with the hockey news. Now, uh, Brandon's going to come up with uh, coming up right now. Hacksaw coming up in, in a minute. Uh, but just before we bring in a uh, Brandon, we've got a little bit more from Bones that we'll be discussing with Rewiki. Uh, let's go to uh, Bones. Bones talked about today's practice without Mark Shifley, but everybody else in a regular jersey. Here's uh, Rick Bonus on today. We had to get the hard work back in, but actually, after I left you guys the other night, I had a few guys come up to me and they wanted to skate yesterday. So yesterday we had we had Wednesday off. Yesterday we had half the team out, and all they wanted was a light practice, a light skills day. 
So half the team did skate yesterday, but they, the guys that needed the two days off took advantage of that. Uh, but today was a work day. Get back in at it and push the pedal down and, and make it physical and put them in game situations. So it's going to be a tough game, a tough road trip. It'll start tomorrow afternoon in Ottawa. So we wanted to make it a tougher practice. All right, so uh, there's Bones. Now, um, is it, is it, uh, uh, one clip we'll get to in just one second, but there's one other one that I want to get to. And this is interesting. I mean, Bones comparing the Jets to uh, other teams that he's coached and what he's seen so far now into the second half of the season in the lofty spot that there are in the standings. This is for Reem. It's the same thing. You start, you, you put the plans in place in training camp and, um, and, and you even in Dallas, like when I took over in Dallas, the team was playing well. It wasn't that there was playing bad. We didn't have to make a lot of changes then. We made changes in training camp the next year to the way we were playing, and it took a while to get those implemented. But that was also the year of the COVID. We ended up going to the finals. Um, so, yeah, uh, Tampa took a couple of years there to put things in place as well. Like, it doesn't happen overnight. But the more you keep the group together and the more you keep harping on the same details of the game, the more ten, the more times you see them falling into those tendencies. All right, so there's Rick Bonus. And here's one more. Of course, we're going to talk with Brandon. Is that everyone around the hockey world sort of looking ahead to the trade deadline and potential moves. Uh, Bones was asked, especially in this case, with everybody contributing and the chemistry of this team being so good, how can uh, the challenges of bringing in a player but not disrupting team chemistry when it comes to a deadline acquisition or something in advance? Let's say the team is capable of that. That would depend on the player coming in. He has to be buying. It's not the room. I'm not worried about the room accepting anybody. That's not an issue. The issue would be like the type of character we're bringing into the room because some guys just don't fit in right they just don't no matter what you're doing so uh, i'm not worried about this team accepting anybody anyone can come in here and fit right in these guys are great to with everyone and every all the new players say that this is unreal how well they're treated and how well they blend in, in so quickly uh so bringing somebody else in most of that would depend on that player coming in and buying in to see what's going on here how much are you involved in that then when that process because because i mean you would have the best finger on the pulse as to what would be a good fit in this room and what kind of player and that sort of thing given your vast knowledge too of the league get to that point chevy will have those discussions with me i don't need to be in on daily daily discussions when something comes up that's close and we'll talk about it all right there's some bones from earlier today shout out to dave Banuk and uh illegal curve again for uh, that audio and uh again i see tomorrow busy day for the ic boys getting up early and then uh, an early post game show before KNR after the 2 p.m. start. Let's bring in Brandon Rewicki, our longtime pal, now host of Skates and Plates. Rue, what's going on? How are you? Oh, are you back? Uh, for... Oh, you're back. You're back. Sorry. We're good. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm doing good, man. Slightly different location, hectic times as usual. Coffee number three or four. I don't even know, but we're. We're, we're at Friday. They let us get to Friday, so that's all that matters. Yeah, I see one of your little munchkins in the background on the Hot Wheels oh, there in the in the hallway cruising around. Always nice to do it. Hey, you got lots on your plate. I love to do it. Um, Let's get into uh, – for, for, I want to talk about potential acquisitions and whatnot from uh, from your perspective. But uh, no Shifley tomorrow going into Ottawa – uh, Hellebuck starting, which I have to admit, maybe surprised me a little bit. I thought they might give him the break, and uh, although it would be then six days from the Tuesday night start to a Monday start. Um, but listen, the Jets are still number one in points percentage. They've got some games in hand on other teams. If they can win them, they'll stay on top of the league. What do you make of this three-game road trip and the challenge of at least starting it without Mark Shifley trying to keep their lofty spot in the standings? Well, let's touch on the Hellebuck thing quickly there, because I think this what what you just said there is what this team always does, and that's why Hellebuck always ends up having like sixty five starts by the end of the year. It's like, oh well, we got six days of rest here. Of course, we got to throw him in before he gets rusty. Well, Bones but- has said LB's playing this week, like, and I thought that he was going to get one of these starts. I just, I, I, I kind of thought that they might go with him first. And then roll with Hellebuck in Boston in the two Toronto games. But 
I, I, my, my take on this is that they have enough confidence in LB that they're going to space these starts out and probably let him go on Monday against Boston. Yeah, I, I would have... I mean, personally, with these four before the All-Star break, why not just split them 50-50 and give, and give Helly a little bit extra rest, right? And then you want to push him once the All-Star break comes to an end to try to make a run for that number one seed. Then at least you have, you know, you can say, hey, we give him a little bit of rest and now we can throw him into the meat grinder for, you know, eight, nine, or ten games, whatever it might be. I mean, yeah, I mean, the nice thing with the Jets right now, Hus, it's all minor things, right? Yeah. We're talking about Mason Appleton's ice time and should Laurent Brassois be getting more starts as the backup goalie because he's playing well. You've also got the Vesna front runner right now in front of him. So um, good problems to have. Ottawa, Ottawa's got to be the most disappointing team in hockey this year, right? I know right some there. people have mentioned Buffalo. Buffalo's at least, I mean, they are disappointing. They're at least in the mix, though. Ottawa was supposed to take the next step and they're just, uh, I, I, you want, I mean, you want to talk about trade targets too. We'll be up front and personal with with one of them uh, Saturday afternoon. I don't I don't know if now's the time to make a move for somebody like that, but um, I'm I'm intrigued to see him in action, uh, which we might talk about there. But um, with the the Boston game and the back to back against the Leafs before the break, your, it's your classic you know look ahead game. So we'll see. They haven't had that problem yet so far this year. The Jets have with staying focused, but um, would, wouldn't be bad grabbing the two points here and then. You know, going two and one in the next three is a pretty good stretch headed into the break. Yeah, no doubt about that. And again, uh, you know, hey, listen, if the Jets could be number one in the league at the All Star break, I think everyone would love that. And and there really is. I mean, as much as we say, hey, everything happens in the playoffs, and that's where it's really <laughs> determined. That's true. Would it be great to hang a Central Division banner up? Absolutely, it'd be great for the team. They haven't done it before, but there's a lot that goes into that home ice in the playoffs and. <laughs> Not having to play Dallas or Colorado in the first That's round. It. Never mind if you can be first in the West, getting the second wild card team, which I think is probably going to be coming out of that group of Nashville, Arizona, St. Louis, Minnesota, Calgary, or the Kraken, unless the Kings just keep on stinking it up as they have been and somehow fall into that eighth spot. Like, there definitely is a lot to it more than um, just a, a nice banner to throw up in the, uh, in, in, you know, in your arena. Yeah, 100%. And, and for me, it's not even first in the West. It's just first in the division. Like, to, to let Colorado Dallas beat the hell out of each other yeah. and take the, the wound, assuming you get through the wild card, take the somewhat wounded opponent in round two. Because, I mean, like, there's the chance that if you, you drop down to two, three, like they have to be Colorado and Dallas and then Edmonton, Vancouver, Vegas, like, ah, man, it's, it's, that's a brutal, that's a brutal one to try to get through there. Um, I, I kind of, with the way the schedules played out and, and the standings have played out so far this year, honestly, Hus, I feel like the one seeds in the West is similar to how the NFL used to give the buy to the top two teams in the conference. There's just so much value in in you know, kind of disparaging the wild card teams, calling them a buy. But like you get what I'm saying, right? Where that that, that it's, it's just a massive. It doesn't guarantee you anything, but it's a massive advantage compared to the two three teams in each side that have to go through each other and then go through a couple more teams just to get to the final. No, there's no doubt about that. All right, you know what? I want to talk about a couple potential trade targets. We've heard the report that the Jets have been kicking tires on Chicken. It was a player that they were interested in last year. Um, and there's Chris Tanev. Uh, and, and I'll ask you your preference based on everything that would be involved in it. You've got a younger player with a team with a, a you know with some team control, if you will, one more year. Um, but at the same time, you look at the way the Jets shape up for next season, and I'm not sure that Tanev with an expiring contract, knowing that you might be bringing in an ELC player like an Elias Salmonson in, doesn't make more sense. Uh, answer this in two ways. Who makes the most sense for the team come playoff time? Like, who's a better ad, regardless of contract and regardless of how much they make? And then, big picture, does one make more sense because of having an extra year or a lack of an extra year on the contract? So for, I, I, it's funny because I, I think they're different answers. Um, I, I, I like, I like Tanev's game. Like I, I really do. Me too. And 
you know, Brendan Dillon's kind of the main one that brings it right now. But like in terms of elements missing on the Jets back end, you know, Tanev brings that in a in a big, big way. Um, and it's wild, too, because he was like w- when he signed with Calgary initially, I thought he was done. Like he just so many injuries. There's no way this guy can play anymore. And he actually got healthier somehow and then took his game to a higher level. Totally. So. I, I think just in terms of what they bring to the table, and it's funny too because Chickren's younger, a physical specimen, but he's actually ends up being hurt more than than Tanev is right now. So I kind of like Tanev's game better, but I think everything else pushes me towards Chickren. Um, I've I've said this before a number of times, but I, I I just feel like having that extra year or two when it comes to the trade deadline is massive, and the prices don't change all that much. Um, I mean, as well, you know. Chikrin kind of seems like a Zach Bogosian type. You know what I mean? Like he likes the the wilderness and he eats only meat and all that weird stuff. But like I, he, he's a guy that might legitimately sign here in Winnipeg long term, right? If you bring him into the fold. Um, so I, I think it's two different answers. With defensemen, though, Hus, I, I, I wouldn't look at I wouldn't hate either deal. I and, w- and when you talk about the room and what bonus said there and fits and different things like that, the only thing with bringing a defenseman in is your, like, you have to ship somebody out. Somebody that's playing, right? Like, there's just no room. There's already the logjam that that exists here, and and there's no room right now. I mean, maybe you could fit it in under the cap, depending on what you do up front, but you probably have to move a regular out of your lineup. And then, so then you have to deal with that sort of, okay, you know, are they going to fit with what we're doing, A, and then B, is there going to be a bit of a blowback in terms of subtracting somebody from the roster too? So I personally, I'm, I'm all in on let's grab a high end forward, whatever high end forward is available. And let's, let's bring them into the mix as opposed to the trying to alter the composition of the defense core right now, because while it's not the, you know, two studs that Vegas had last year, sort of defense, it's a team defense that's playing as good as anybody in the NHL right now. What um, if we're talking Tanev and we're talking Chikrin? How do you think the price would differ between the two, knowing that one's older, one's on an expiring contract, one's younger, um, certainly less maybe accomplished at this level, certainly come certainly playoff wise, um, but has an extra year at a cost that you know what it's going to be. So Ottawa gave up pretty high first round pick. And then I think two seconds, something along those lines. And that was for two-ish years of, of Chikrin. So, I mean, I, I don't think the price... I mean, you're talking at least a first and a second for Chikrin. Um, I guess it depends if they want a prospect or something back. But Ottawa's also made it clear by the sounds of things that they want, like, they want some veteran pieces to come in too. So, like, I don't know if there's somebody on Winnipeg that would fit that mold for Ottawa. But it, it's it's... There's no doubt the price is going to be substantially steeper with with Chikrin as opposed to to Chris Tanev. Tanev's an interesting one. I mean, it kind of depends too if Calgary moves on from Hannafin. If, if they keep Hannafin, then the defense market really dries up on on the trade front, right? And and maybe maybe Calgary could squeeze out a first rounder for him. Um, that that price is a little steep for me. If you're talking a second round pick as a, as a rental for Chris Tanev, I I think that's a great deal, especially because it's going to be a late second round pick. I, I don't know if I'd feel super happy about giving up a first um, for potentially a couple of months of Chris Tanev. Yeah, they do have that Habs second rounder from the PLD trade, um, you know, which is which is a real nice asset for Shevel Day off yep. to have in yep. this case. I mean, you know, I mean, if we're looking at the league right now. You know, Montreal is in the bottom 10. So, you know, that that could potentially be, like you know. Like 38th overall? Yeah, 38, 40th uh, in the league, you know, which certainly does have uh, does have some value, more than a second rounder of a team that's, you yeah. know, at the top of the standings. You're basically looking at 60th overall. So that is an asset. And then, you know, I, I think we probably – are going to be getting into a conversation about some of the Jets' prospects. Now, for either of those players, I don't think McGordy's on the table. I don't think Sal Monson's on the table. And, you know, it's funny, and I bring up Sal Monson because 
I really do think that he projects to be a guy that will get a chance to potentially play with the Jets next year. I know a lot of times they'll bring the guys and let them be with the Moose for a while, but, I mean, we saw the way they paired him with Josh Morrissey earlier. He's playing a second year uh, at a very high level in a top Swedish league with men on a real strong squad. And if you're keeping some of these other guys, if you're going to extend, you need to have, you know, an ELC player or two. Um, now, you know, is Billy Hanela one of the guys that potentially gets moved? I mean, I guess that certainly is a possibility. Um, and a player like Chaz Lucius, I think his value is a little lower just because he can't stay healthy. Although maybe there's a team that would look in. Like I could see maybe a Lucius and a second rounder or something being something the Jets would be willing to trade if they could make that happen. Whether it's enough to get it done on an expiring deal like Tanev, I guess time will tell. Um, but both of those players are intriguing. Um, the other guy, what, what's Walker's contract situation in Philly? Is he expiring deal this year? Yeah, expiring. I, I think it's two point six million, but in an, in and around the two and a half million range, um, and, and and a pending UFA. You know, um, I, I mean, the funny thing about it is, is the Philly just keeps on winning, and. Like, and I don't know whether that, like, let's assume that they continue to be a team that's right there in the mix for a playoff spot what, beyond the deadline, because I think that it would take a major bottoming out, which I don't think is coming from Torts' club to do that. I mean, you've got a pretty good pulse of that club. I mean, they do have new management. They are thinking the future. But Torts in that group, I think, is also thinking the present. They'd love to get back to the playoffs. Walker was a guy that everyone thought, oh, he'll be available for sure. I'm not sure that that's really the case so much anymore. How do you read the situation? Well, <laughs> I think I was on last week, and I was like, yeah, they're going to move him no way. And now they're two points out of first place. <laughs> like, it, it started where they're at the wild card spot. It's like, well, obviously they'll move him. Then it's third. Then it's second. Now it's almost first. Um, I mean, look, there there's still a lot of hockey before the deadline. I, I think... I think the surprise trade of of Gauthier and Drysdale does help the Flyers a little bit that they can move Walker because you essentially brought someone in to replace him in a sense. Um, I also think there's the chance and, and kind of how I would like the Flyers to go about it. You know, just because you sell some of your pending UFAs doesn't mean you can't buy as well. Um, I think San Jose did this a few years back where they moved some pending UFAs and then with some of that draft capital, you know, they, they still ended up with a surplus of picks, but they moved out some guys, uh, moved out some picks to bring in some guys that can still help them in the playoff run. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw the Flyers do something like that, where they move on. I, I, I just think Sean Walker's become surprisingly too valuable of a trade piece in year one of your supposed rebuild to just hold on to him because you're playing good hockey right now. Um, but hey, if did they the, resign him? I don't think it's impossible. They, I, I, I do think the Drysdale trade changed the equation a little bit, though, because now they've also got a bit of a log jam there, and they want to get some of their young defensemen some ice time as well. I, I think, I do think they'll trade. I mean, I don't know how realistic Ristolainen being moved is, but I, I think they trade one of Walker or Ristolainen. I still think it's going to end up being Sean Walker, but I won't be surprised if, say, they move him for a second round pick that they then trade, I don't know, a fourth-round pick to pick up a defenseman that can essentially take his place. I, I, I just, I, They've said all the right things so far. I'm going to believe in Danny B. Um, the main thing as a Flyer fan right now, Huss, is that I'm just like, I'm, I'm enjoying the ride to just troll Penguins fans and Islanders fans. Like, I just, I don't even, I have no, I have no, like, qualms about them actually being a cup team, but it's more so like, let's just, eliminate teams that actually tried to win the cup this year because it's hilarious and that's all we have you know you mentioned wrist and i've got to ask you about this and again i was out of town so i didn't see the game on saturday um but we all remember the doom and gloom about the acquisition <laughs> of him and how i mean that it was hilarious it sounded like the canuck fan base frankly when they signed him to his deal uh i haven't heard any of that this year um how has he been and uh, is he uh like, has he kind of shut some people up with the way that he's played, or they just moved on to focusing on other things? The fact that the team's actually winning. He's, he's, I mean, look, he's legitimately a good defenseman. I'm not going to say he's a hey, top pair guy for the next 10 years. The Flyers just did a bunch of work 
and they had to erase you know seven years of bad habits in buffalo <laughs> but but they put enough bleach on it they wiped it out and it took some time but i mean he's he, he's he, I, I think he's a good number four defenseman like i think if he's on you know he's not going to be a driver on one of your top two pairs but if you can put him beside somebody, you know, funny enough, I he, stylistically he might be a good fit for for a guy like Josh Morrissey. Uh, he is a right-handed shot defenseman. I'm not saying the Jets should go out there and move him, but like somebody like that, where it's hey, you take care of the puck, I'll take care of being big and nasty. That that's the kind of defenseman that that he is now. Is he what does he make? Five point two? Is he worth that? Five one? Probably, yeah, probably not. But I th- I think he is a good number four defenseman now, which is. The coaching staff's done a, a real good job with a number of defensemen. Brad Bradshaw, um, if he's not the next head coach in Philly, Huss, that's to me, that's the number one new head coaching candidate in the NHL. If somebody scoops this guy up, I think they're going to be happy for a long time. Um, let me ask you this as far as the Jets goes. Um, I talked about Monaghan earlier, and I, I was never a big Monaghan fan. I, I, I love the fact that he has sort of resuscitated his career. I mean, let's not forget that the Habs... The Flames had to give Montreal a yeah. first-round pick to take him originally. And I know they floated out there looking for a first-round pick for him. I don't think that's happening. But with the package that he brings, especially in the face-off circle, which the Jets struggle at and we know is very important to Rick Bonus, he's making less than $2 million. Does it make sense to go and try and get a Monaghan to come in and round out your forward group to take care of a few of those things that you want. And because of where the Jets are cap-wise, it's not such a big hit that you can maybe still dive in and get a player like a Chris Tanev and fortify the blue line. Yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, if, if you're going to like, hey, we can go push all our chips in for a high-end forward or let's split it out a little bit. I understand that thought process. I, it's a great story that Monaghan's been able to to turn his game back around a little bit, but I I just don't know as far as the price goes. To me, there's a little bit of empty calories in his scoring his production numbers. I mean, he's getting like 18 and a half minutes a night with Montreal power play time. I don't think he's getting any of that in Winnipeg. So you know, he's putting up like I think he's on pace for 50 points. Are you willing to give up a second round pick for somebody that might only be a half a point a game guy? And and how much of an improvement, honestly, Huss, would he be over Domestikov at this point? I, it, it might be marginal at, at most. So I to me, I think Monaghan would be kind of your plan D, plan E. Uh, a bunch of things we worked on didn't work and we want to bring somebody in. Um, I, I, I'd be looking elsewhere in terms of... Um, you know, there's not that many pending UFA forwards that that are going to be available outside of Lindholm and Monaghan. I, I think there's a few options with guys that have term that would be pretty interesting from from Winnipeg side of things. But personally, I'm I'm not looking towards Montreal and and Sean Monaghan coming in. Hey, uh, Brandon, before we go, who you got? Bills, Chiefs, Sunday night. <laughs> I kind of feel like, I mean, I feel like everyone's on Buffalo right now. I kind of feel a little bit like this is Pittsburgh, Washington, back Crosby Ovechkin. And I I just, I wonder a little bit if Kansas City's just got Buffalo's number for whatever reason. I'm kind of sentimentally, I'm cheering for Buffalo. I, I think, I think somehow Kansas City does it. I, I don't know how, but I think somehow Kansas City gets it. I mean, Buffalo, their whole team's injured, basically. But I, I think it's not I good. think the whole Mahomes on the road for the first time thing is is going to be a little overblown. Um, I'm think I'm thinking heartbreak for the Bills. I'm, I'm not cheering for it, but I mean it's it's classic Buffalo, man. So that's that's what I think is going to end up happening. Well, we're going to chop that up with Hacksaw coming up in just a minute. Have an awesome weekend. Love the skates and plates. Uh, enjoy the games both on the ice and the gridiron, and uh, we'll talk to you next week heading into that big Saturday night game against the Leafs before the player break. Sounds good. Have a good weekend. Good stuff. There's Brandon Rewicki with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Yes, we are going to dive into some NFL talk. The Notebook is coming up. And Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. Well, Lee always says it's Beer Friday. And if it's Beer Friday, you know what to make it. Make it Little Brown Jug, Winnipeg's favorite local beer. Great time. Even though it's cold, pop down, see him at the brewery and taproom on William Avenue. Try them all. 
for yourself. You could also pick up your favorite little brown jug favorites there. But if you are heading into your favorite local beer store around the city or Manitoba Liquor Marts, look for Little Brown Jug and take advantage of the great deal on generic lager. Eight packs of Tall Boys, just $19.99. A perfect addition to any Manitoba weekend. And of course, you can also check them out online at littlebrownjug.ca with local delivery options. Um, speaking of the uh, NFL, if you're looking to uh, get your Chiefs or Bills or Ravens or Niners gear because you're confident that you're going to need it for a few more weekends, get to Royal Sports. In addition to all the great NFL merch, Bomber merch, the best selection of Winnipeg Jets gear in town with thousands of pieces of merchandise, all the jerseys, customized with your favorite player's name and number, and uh, tons of exclusives you won't find anywhere else. Of course, you also know they're the hockey Superstore with uh, all equipment for goalies, skaters, you know it. But also, if you're just looking for recreational skates as the trails get open and people hitting the ODRs, Royal's the spot for that. Not to mention snowboards, boots, bindings. They really do have it all. Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway. And follow them on Instagram as well, at Royal Sports Pemina, for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. And hey, uh, tomorrow afternoon might be a great time to saddle up at your local Boston Pizza. You can check out happy hour deals from 3 until 6 during the Winnipeg Jet game. And then just stay in that same spot and enjoy the rest of the NFL action. Nothing like Boston Pizza for the big game with your crew. And hey, if you while you're there, world famous BP Wings, gourmet pizzas, uh, ice cold schooners. And if you are staying at home, you can always get the great taste of Boston pizza by ordering online at bostonpizza.com. All right, my favorite weekend of the year when it comes to football. Well, maybe opening weekend, but we got the top eight remaining teams, four standalone games, and uh, some really, really intriguing matchups. Let's get to the NFL Notebook with Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. And uh, Lee, you're really playing the heel in here, running in here with the Toronto Maple Leaf. Is it, am, I, am I correct? Are you wearing a Leafs hoodie right now? That that That's is funny. that is big time heel move there, Lee. Uh, doing that. We got the Leafs twice next week. Although they did uh, next Saturday at home, next Wednesday in Toronto. It should be great. But uh, we're here to get. Uh, and there's a lot of a lot of Bills fans out there in Toronto. We'll get to that Bills game in a minute, but. Uh, what were your takeaways from last week? Fascinated to hear what your your take is on what the hell happened to the Dallas Cowboys and how Mike McCarthy's staying on as the head coach after that face plant. Well, I, I'm just, first of all, I'm getting all kinds of... Yeah, you know what? Hold on one sec. Oh, one sec. We, sorry, sorry. I forgot to do something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My bad. My bad. Press um, the blue button. Yeah. You hit the red button, you'll start a nuclear war with North Korea. Yeah. You're good now. <laughs> Sorry about that. We're good, we're good. What the hell happened to the Cowboys, and how impressed were you with the Packers, who've got a pretty big uh, test this weekend? I thought Green Bay was going to reach the end of the road. The kid Jordan Love has had himself a phenomenal year, doing it with four rookie wide receivers. I was stunned. Dallas came out so flat. I was shocked. Dak seemed out of sync. They could just never get anything going whatsoever. And Green Bay, and I give Matt LaFleur a lot of credit, he changed up a whole pile of things offensively. They ran the football very early, which I did not expect to see, and Aaron Jones started to bust some runs, so that forced Dallas to do things defensively. Dallas got in front of Jordan Love's face but could never sack him, and then they just started going tempo and changing the scope of the whole offense. They just kept going up and down the field. I was shocked. I mean, considering the Cowboys had played so well from about week six of the season on, and Dak was playing like it was an MVP, they were just not in sync. And I think one of the intangible things was a hustler, one of the guys that made plays all year for them, got psyched out. C.D. Lamb just emotionally got taken out of the game right from the get-go. They jammed him at the line of scrimmage. They roughed him up on the sideline patterns. They knocked him out of bounds. He didn't fight through some of the confrontations physically. He did zero till about middle way of the third quarter of the game when Dallas tried to rally back. So suddenly CD was barking and bitching and not happy at all. And the coaches were unhappy and Dak went and sat and talked to him. The kid just got, I thought, overwhelmed by playing 
in this playoff game. So you you add all the positives good Green Bay did, then the negatives would happen to Dallas. And Sunday night must have been miserable for Jerry Jones. But I will say this. He has been very loyal to all coaches he's hired. Maybe that's because he's a football guy. And that's why McCarthy is coming back. You know, his record is 45 and 26, which is pretty doggone impressive. But haven't done very well in postseason. So I would think next season must be a huge bounce back year, go deep into the playoffs year. Otherwise, Mike McCarthy will be out of there. And he's only got one year left on his contract. Yeah, exactly. Now, um, one other uh, coaching situation I wanted to ask you about coming out of last weekend is in Philly. Um, listen, uh, it, it seemed like Philly just quit on the season in the last half of the, uh, well, the last sort of four or five games and certainly against Tampa. And there's a lot of noise uh, around Nick Sirianni. It sounds like he's going to be back with different coordinators. What do you make of how a team that was 10-1 and one, um, just flamed out the way they did? And are you surprised that Sirianni's coming back considering the history that the Eagles have of moving on from coaches that have had successful seasons in recent years? Owner is very impatient, Jeffrey Lurie. I was told that in their exit meeting, Lurie and Sirianni, Lurie told him, you will present me a list of coordinators that you're going to consider hiring. So there is going to be big shakeup in the staff below Sirianni. I don't think he hit the eject button on them yet. What happened to them? Injuries to a degree. You know, they, they had Darius Slay out their safety for a chunk of the season. They lost a bunch of cornerbacks. Their linebackers, I don't think, played as well the back half of the schedule as they had. I think the whole back seven of the defense just was not the same. And then, then obviously, you get to postseason, their running game disappeared on them. You get to postseason, they lose A.J. Brown with the knee injury. So suddenly, it's Devontae Smith against the world. The tight ends have been dinged up, and they weren't an integral part of the offensive second half of the season. So you can check off a lot of things that weren't the same when they went from 10-1 and one to losing six of their last seven. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an intangible piece of this conversation, too. The guy calling the defensive plays on the sidelines, Matt Patricia, where did he come from? New England. That's another example of a guy coming off the Belichick coaching tree that has failed when he's gone somewhere else. It's absolutely stunning. I, I think that the list I made was this is the seventh or eighth assistant that's gone somewhere else, either as a head coach or a key coordinator. That includes Josh McDaniels. That it just blown up in their face. So it's fascinating to me that New England is all about Belichick and his ability to make it all work because all the guys underneath him, when they've tried to make it work somewhere else, have failed. So I think there will be changes in Philadelphia staff. There's going to be changes in the Pittsburgh staff, even though Mike Tomlin is coming back for, I guess it'd be year 14. So it, it's it's interesting what's happening. And then, of course, we've got all the other openings that are still there and waiting for these jobs start to get filled. Yeah, um, you know, yeah, let's get there before we uh, get to the games on the weekend. Um, a, an incredible list of candidates, which I think made it more surprising that Jerry and Lurie didn't maybe move on from McCarthy and Sirianni because of guys that were out there. But uh, Phyllis said on the latest on Belichick, Jim Harbaugh, Pete Carroll, as well as what the Chargers and the Raiders are doing. Raiders, many people thought that they'd already have their coach, that they had their guy. Doesn't seem to be the case. Okay, let's start with Harbaugh. He has interviewed now in L.A. with the Chargers, a four-hour interview on Monday. I believe it was Wednesday. He's been to Atlanta to meet with them. That's a backup situation for the Falcons. Uh, I, I hear Washington may contact him. Washington has been very silent as to what they're going to do to replace Ron Rivera. They've not kind of jumped into the water because everybody is now doing Zoom interviews with all these guys who are in the playoffs, and they'll do follow-up face-to-face as soon as the team gets knocked out of the postseason. Uh, but I, I got to believe right now Harbaugh is negotiating at Michigan and negotiating with the Chargers. But there are glitches in both places. Harbaugh wants $12.5 million to stay at the University of Michigan. And he came up with this idea. This is what's been reported, and I believe it's true. He wants a, quote, immunity clause. That if the NCAA goes in and cracks on them, that Michigan can't fire him. There's, there's an NCAA investigation, not about Spygate but about COVID violations during a COVID blackout in 2020 that Michigan violated by recruiting players. Tennessee did it. Tennessee got hit with a four-year probation. Arizona State did it. Uh, Antonio Pierce was the ringleader of that. They all got fired. 
Uh, and now they're investigating Michigan for the same thing. I don't know how Harbaugh thinks Michigan can dictate to the NCAA league office that you can't fire my coach, even if we get put on probation for the COVID recruiting violations. He wants an immunity clause. Uh, last I heard, you know, some politician here, the state side's asking for immunity. Uh, president, ex-president, that, that's weird. He's also obviously negotiated with the Chargers, but he wants total authority. He wants coach, 12 to 15 million per year. He wants the right to bring his team in and put them in the front office and player personnel. I don't know if that's, if that's going to work because the president of football operations is John Spanos, the son of the owner, who's accomplished nothing, but he's still in place there despite firing all these coaches and then just firing the general manager. So Harbaugh wants everything if he moves to Los Angeles. So as I sit here on a Friday, I can't tell you whether his mailing address will be SoFi Stadium, care of the Chargers, or whether it will be Ann Arbor, care of University of Michigan. So you got that scenario. Belichick back in Atlanta, second interview, face-to-face, one-on-one with Arthur Blank. And I think I mentioned to you last week, I thought Belichick was going to land in Atlanta. That looks like that's going to happen. Uh, nothing on Pete Carroll, which shocks me. Uh, Pete Carroll, I, I think, has still got a lot of gas left, still wants to coach, but has not had an interview that I know of as of now. And I asked the question to the Chargers publicly. I wrote a column about it. Why the hell have you not called Belichick and not called Pete Carroll yet? You need to throw your logo into the water and see if they're interested because I, I happen to think the Bolts job is the best one because they got the quarterback, Justin Herbert. But Pete Carroll has not interviewed. And now the late addition is going to start getting interviews pretty quickly Mike Vrabel, he's going to be in L.A. to meet with the Chargers tomorrow. He just got deposed in Tennessee. He's going to get some action other places, too, maybe Washington, et cetera. So, and then you get, and then you got Dan Quinn. Quinn is interviewing at this hour with the Chargers. Quinn's going to Seattle. He might be the Seahawks pick to replace Pete Carroll. And, and then you got all the veteran guys, the Raheem Morrises of the world, the Leslie Frazier's of the world. Uh, these defensive coordinators have kind of reinvented their resume these guys are going to be in the mix. There's still seven jobs open at this point in time. That's a long answer to your question. Hope I didn't confuse you. And you're wearing red gear. You're out in the cold all week drinking. You're probably confused, but that's that's the sum total of where we are. You'd be surprised, Lee, that for the first time ever, uh, no beers at the game on Saturday at Arrowhead. It was that cold. The thing would freeze in literally two minutes. It was, um, it, it was survival mode um, at Arrowhead, and the Chiefs survived... The Dolphins, oh man, that was a tough spot. Let's get to these games on the weekend. And uh, why don't we start with the main event? Give us your breakdown of Bills, Chiefs, Allen versus Mahomes. Um, far and away the closest spread for the game. Uh, Bills right now two and a half point favorites, it seems. Basically the home field advantage. Mahomes has had Josh Allen's number. Mahomes is 8-1 and one as an underdog in his career. And they're still the champs until someone beats him. But... The Bills have some momentum with their second half of the season and now for the first time playing at home. And Mahomes has to go on the road for the first time in the playoffs outside of neutral site Super Bowls. Uh, I can't wait for this one. And I think the entire football world is looking forward to this finale of the four games on the weekend. The weather forecast is cloudy, snow showers, single digit temperatures with wind chill and a 100 percent chance of Josh Allen. It's going to be unbelievable. And Josh Allen is just having a, a mega star season. He's got over 5,000 all purpose yards now, Hustler. 48 touchdowns he's responsible for throwing and running. He's having a spectacular career playing at home with all that skill around him, with the weatherman on his side, and with 76,000 people with snow shovels in that stadium. I mean, that's, that's a phenomenal venue. I will say this about Mahomes. I mean, he's done it every place. Granted, this is his first postseason game on the road, but dude has played in a lot of enemy territory situations and obviously has been in the Super Bowl. That being said, uh, he is 10-2 and two in postseason play, regardless of where the games were played. The guy has been very, very productive. And I, I just went back and researched it last night. His career record is 86-26. and 26. 86 and 26. That's pretty good. What they did last week, what they did to Miami was, first of all, Miami couldn't throw the football because of the wind and the snow. And I think it psyched the Dolphins out completely. But what, what Mahomes did, and I think he'll do it again against Buffalo, he's just going to trust two people. 
And that's the only people he can trust on the offense. He's going to trust Travis Kelsey, and he's going to trust Rishi Rice. And between them, those guys caught 15 balls last week. And they'll throw to the other tight ends, which they did. And if it's windy and cold, it would be a shorter passing game. But he's got the people to be able to get it open. And I think the intangibles is if, if the weather really is rugged, which running back is going to be able to pound it? Uh, James Cook has had a mystical season in Buffalo. Uh, the brother of Dalvin Cook, the ex-Viking. And there's no doubt that Pacheco is a tough guy. And no matter what the elements are, he can run the ball for Kansas City. So I think it's going to be a spectacular game. Is it Sunday night yet? I can't wait. I think it's, I think it's going to be a fun, fun game. No, it is. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's what everyone was hoping to see, and we're going to get it. Hopefully they can get that stadium shoveled out in time for fans to actually sit in seats as opposed to go through snowbanks to get there. Um, let's quickly hit on these other three games. By the way, Marbles is open. If you just popped in, exclamation mark Marbles in the chat. We'll get to that in just a minute. Um, Houston at Baltimore and the Packers coming off that wild win against the uh, Dallas that we talked about. Both nine and a half point underdogs. Big, big dogs against the two number one seeds. Do you see either of the underdogs being able to uh, keep these games close or is this all about the number one seeds that, you know, had the extra week of rest and been preparing all week without having to go through a big win last week on the road. Hey, having a first round buy in the playoffs is like having a piece of gold in your pocket. It gives you not only time to get healthy, not only recharge your emotional batteries because it's a long grind of a season, but it gives you 10 days to game plan. And I think they Baltimore sees everything that Houston has ever run under C.J. Stroud. He's had a phenomenal rookie season, but Baltimore's got Lamar. And Baltimore is three deep at running back with a quarterback. They're averaging 4.9 yards per carry. Baltimore has got four receivers, and they're catching everything. And now they're going to get possibly Mark Andrews, the tight end back. And by the way, if that's not enough, Baltimore's defense has got 60 sacks and 31 takeaways, and they're playing at home. And the weather's been kind of ratty there. Houston, you're not playing indoors. You're going to Baltimore, which means snow and slush and cold and blah, 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 winter weather. So I, I think Baltimore coming off the bye with a piece of gold in their pocket, probably wins that game. Uh, in terms of Green Bay, San Francisco, what a mystical s- season that Jordan Love has had. What a job Matt LaFleur has done, and they're doing it with all kid-wide receivers and a r- young tight end. What Green Bay's accomplished is spectacular, but San Francisco's got a piece of gold in its pocket, and now you have had 10 to 12 days to rest Christian McCaffrey. You had that nagging calf injury. you know. So you're sitting there with Purdy. CMC's got over 2,000 all-purpose yards. And if you think you can shut Purdy down and control McCaffrey, then who else, unless you're playing by Canadian Football League rules and have 13 guys on the field, who else is going to stop Debo and Ayuk and Kittle? I mean, they've got every component there is, and obviously their defense is pretty good. That'll be that'll be the, a good weather game, which should make for interesting football to, to see how Jordan Love copes with everything that San Francisco's got. But first go... Coming off the week, looks loaded and ready to go. And then the final game is Detroit-Tampa Bay. The whole world seems to be rooting for the Lions, and why not? What a job Dan Campbell has done over three years building this thing. What a job Baker Mayfield's done. You know, he's resurrected his career. He probably saved Todd Bowles' coaching job, and he's been red hot the second half of the season. But I went back and dug this out. Tampa Bay, for all the things they've done, they got 11 wins this season. They're only 2-5 and five against good teams. 2-5. and five. Now, they've played a bear of a schedule, and that, that's hard to believe. They played the Eagles. This is the second time they're playing the Lions. They played Buffalo, Houston, San Francisco, Green Bay. So they've not done well against really good teams. And by the way, they're playing in Detroit, which right now thinks itself as a really good team. And I, I think it'll be fun to watch Jared Goff and Baker Mayfield just heave it down the field because I definitely think they will. Yeah, we might be on the over on that one. Uh, Baker looked good last week, but... Uh, there is something special going on in Detroit right now, and I heard a number of Rams players say that was the loudest stadium they have ever been in uh, last week in that uh, the one thriller that we had in Wild Card Weekend. Lee, have a great weekend. Uh, people are asking to see this hoodie again. Um, I'm not sure why, uh, but you know, supporting the most hated team in the National Hockey League, the Toronto Maple Leafs. We'll talk to you next Friday in between the home-and-home home series between the Jets and the Leafs, and I hope you'll be on the right side, the team at the top of the standings right now, the team in Winnipeg, not Toronto. Oh, you said Vancouver? Vancouver's got 30 wins, pal. 
Um, yeah, you know well, they, they got the win last night, but right now the Jets will retake them tomorrow when they play Ottawa. Fingers crossed. They do have the best points percentage in the league right now. It's wild. There could be a lot of Canadian content and head-to-head matchups in the playoffs, which would be phenomenal for fans here north of the border. Yeah, I'll tell you what Vancouver's done. Obviously, what the PEG has done. Maple Leafs have grossly underachieved. And then we haven't mentioned Alberta, Edmonton. Twelve in Temperature a row. was 46 below there early this week. <laughs> I got a text from a friend who wanted to know if he could move in, move into my house here in San Diego because it was 46 bleeping degrees below zero. That was Fahrenheit. That was not centigrade. So uh, it's, you know, NHL is doing well, not this side of the border. I'm dealing with a Kings team that has now lost 10 of the last 11. And suddenly, you're sure you don't want Pierre-Luc Dubois back? We're good. He's starting to take some, taking some huge heat here in Los Angeles. That and I got the injury ravaged Anaheim Ducks of tanking and playing for the first pick in the draft. So there's a lot, lot to cover down here. But check my website, LeeHacksawHamilton.com, despite what I'm wearing. But I told Hustler two weeks ago I wore a Winnipeg Jets hoodie. Yeah, that was you can giving me credit for what I would do down the road. So I guess you're going to take those points back. Yes, well, next week, let's get the Jets one back on because it's Jets and Leafs on Wednesday and Saturday. We're looking forward to it. Hey, enjoy the weekend. It's going to be amazing, Lee. I can't wait to talk to you next week when we get ready for the Final Four. And enjoy Beer Friday. Thanks, pal. (laughs) You got it. There it is, Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. Check out the website, LeeHacksawHamilton.com, and search and subscribe to his Instagram and YouTube for some great video content on both of those platforms as well. All right. Last call for Marvels. Uh, we'll do that in just a minute. Looks like we've got a great turnout again for the uh, <laughs> for the weekly Marble race coming up. Um, but just to recap the odds over at Cool Bet, we've got our picks in from today's lock shop. Man, I had such a hard time picking these first two games with the nine and a half point spreads. Earlier on in the week, I was feeling the underdogs, I think both of those. The more I think about this Ravens-Texans game, despite Lamar Jackson's 1-3 and record in the playoffs, I think I'm going to lean on the Ravens. They have destroyed some teams at home this year, including some good teams like Seattle, like Detroit. I think Detroit lost by 32 when they went to Baltimore. I'm afraid that it might be striking midnight for C.J. Stroud and the Houston Texans, but the Ravens, 9.5 point favorites in that game. And it's a similar nine points, nine and a half point spread with the Packers and the 49ers. I'm a little more optimistic that the Packers can make this one a game, though. Uh, probably be leaning on the Packers at plus nine and a half. On Sunday, 2 p.m. Winnipeg time, they kick off at Ford Field in Detroit, which will be absolute bedlam. Detroit, six and a half point favorites against the Buccaneers. And now, it, it, interesting, this line has moved with the Chiefs and Bills. It's been two and a half, it's been three, it's been two and a half, it's been three. The spread has actually moved now to three points. Uh, if you want to take the Bills, it's just around even money at minus 102. Chiefs plus three is minus 115. Uh, if you take it back to plus two and a half, the Chiefs are basically right at even money at minus 101. The Bills at minus two and a half. But there has been a little bit of an uptake on the money line, and that is just for the team to win. The Chiefs were plus 121 earlier in the week, plus 125 right now for Mahomes and the team in red. Buffalo minus 147. There is also some divisional round specials, which quarterback will have the most passing yards, highest scoring team, lowest scoring team, and the highest and lowest scoring games. You can get on those as well. And the futures right now heading into this final week, the Niners, your Super Bowl favorites at plus 175. The Ravens, Ravens were three to one. That's gone down slightly to plus 285. The Bills, six to one. The Chiefs and Lions, eight to one. Packers, 25 to one. And then 28 to one for the Texans and the Buccaneers. I was hoping we might have a Jets Ottawa line right now. That'll probably come out a little later on today. Um, but four games in the National Hockey League tonight Detroit at Carolina. Carolina, a big minus 209 favorite. The Devils, a minus 150 favorite in Columbus to take on the Blue Jackets. The Wild got pumped last night by Tampa. Now they're in South Florida to take on the Panthers. The Panthers, 
minus 214 favorites. And the Islanders, big road favorites at minus 233 in Chicago to take on the Blackhawks. It's all there. We will have a lock shop exclusive a little later on today for the playoffs. You can check that out on Saturday. It's all there at coolbet.com. And if you haven't played a cool bet before, use the promo code WST for a 100% bonus up to 200 bucks on your first deposit. If you want more on the NFL playoff games, check out the lock shop over on YouTube at Edmonton Sports Talk or the Lock Shop Podcast for today's episode. All right. Remo, have you uh, have you given a, a take yet in on this Bills Chiefs game while we get ready for uh while we get ready for the uh marbles? I really liked Billick's analogy that uh, remember that time where the Patriots just beat up on the Colts all the time and then one you know there was that one year the Colts got over the hump and played the worst team in the Super Bowl and the Bears. Although then I liked uh, Ruwicki's analogy that they're like the Capitals who could never beat uh the Penguins. Although the Capitals did win Eventually, I'm going to go with all, you know what, We're, I want you to be in a good mood, Huss, on Monday. Yes, the show's yes. better when you're in a good mood. I don't want you to be sad. I know how it affects you. <laughs> so I'm going to go with the Chiefs uh, to an I will tow the company line cheering for the Chiefs. I like it. Done. I like it. And we also want more Taylor Swift. I don't know if there's any Taylor Swift props, but... I said to I said to waiters, will she be wearing the same jacket made by Kyle Juszczyk's wife? And how many people will be wearing uh, Christina Juszczyk's? Uh, is that her name? Christina Juszczyk's uh, uh, I believe apparel. it is. I know I Simone it. Biles was uh, wear, rocking a vest made by her on watching the Packers. Taylor uh, Lautner as yes, well, who as well. Uh, was in, I think, uh, was he in Harry Potter or... I'm not sure why that guy's famous, but he's uh, yeah, a he's been in stuff. Dude. Oh, Kristen he's from Detroit. U- yeah, Kristen Juszczyk on uh, Instagram. So we'll see got, this weekend. Uh, after uh, after Taylor Swift and Britney wore those, she got an extra four hundred thousand Instagram followers. <laughs> Man, those are sweet jackets. I want one. You should <laughs> They're hire really her. cool. I saw the video of like taking an actual jersey, chopping them up, and then uh, making things happen. So yeah, there's Lautner wearing his thing. That'd be a uh, at 25 mil darn view. nice and i guess she's there wearing you know and shout out to use check and, and and fullbacks in mm-hmm. general not enough great fullbacks anymore um oh twilight that's right thank you doug phil i i couldn't remember if it was i mean i'm not we don't know twilight, twilight. come on i'm not gonna yeah. know that twilight we're yeah. not in the demographic but I, that's why harry potter twilight that's sort of the same uh the same sort of thing twilight right. game on Please. you know what okay here we go before we get to uh the marbles why not question of the day? It's very simple. And I mean, if you want to put in your favorite pick on one of the other three games, please do. But let's see where the chat's at right now on the main event. Are you riding with Mahomes and the Chiefs on the road or Josh Allen and the Bills at home? Let us know in the chat for the uh, why not question of the day for not Autocorp at Waverly and McGilvery. Um all right, one thing we can be guaranteed of, Remo, is a great turnout. Oh, yes, we've got the poll in there. What is the poll? And by the way, as you can see, uh, we've got some moose tickets to give away for Saturday and for Tuesday. Um, so click on that link if you would like to uh, like to get it on. So put in your vote for Chiefs Bills while we're getting marbles ready. And uh, <laughs> Remo, let's, uh, let's make this happen. A little marble race to finish off a great week. Sure. Yeah, we gave away the Saturday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday for the moose tickets. Uh, WinnipegSportsTalk.com slash contest. And I'm enjoying the comment. That's a troll poll if I've ever seen one. I think that was that Spency and 71% has riding with the bills. Everyone's trolling you here. Well, it's beautiful. You know what they say, fade the public. So uh, let's roll. <laughs> let's roll. Chiefs, money line. And next week, a uh, likely trip to Baltimore. And Connor, I know. Listen, I'm not thinking that the Niners are going to lose this game. Don't take don't take that wrong way. I just think that the Packers. Um, I, I think the Packers are playing well enough, and Jordan Love's on one right now that they can, you know, at least keep it within nine points, even if it's just a late little backdoor cover right now. Really tough. Like I don't have a real strong feeling on either of the early games. I think I'm going to ride with Baker and the uh, the Bucks just to keep it close, but I really do think we're going to see 
the three favorites win in the first three games, Baltimore, San Francisco, Detroit. And then uh, I'm certainly hoping that we get the uh, the underdog, the betting underdog, slight underdog, the Chiefs get it done for that 5.30 kickoff on Sunday afternoon at uh, hopefully a fully shoveled stadium in Buffalo. If you're going to the game, bring a shovel, as Hacksaw said. All right, it's Marbles time. Let's get to it. Tristan Rivers music always kicks it off. I'm not sure what not sure what version we have of the Marbles theme song today, but they're always awesome. So uh, let's hear from Tristan and then get ready to finish off the week with a marble race on WST. It's Friday. Another week of words gone by. You deserve to treat yourself maybe an ice cream cake or a bottle of rye. All right, there we are. And uh, hey, just while we're talking NFL, shout out to Mark, uh, Mark and Fanasuk, who just mentioned in chat, Adam Schefter reporting that the Raiders are working to finalize a deal to hire Antonio Pierce as their head coach. He was their interim coach. The players were campaigning for him. Max Crosby said he'd be asking for a trade if they didn't hire him. So he certainly had some great support from the players and uh, saying, welcome home coach. Uh, Hey, I'll tell you what, he, uh, he got them playing for him. There's no doubt about that. Night and day as to what that team was under uh, Josh McDaniels. All right, Marbles time, Remo. What do we got for uh, for today? Yeah, first of all, that was the Green Day version of the Marble Race song. I don't know if you've seen Green Day, been in the news a lot. They got a new album out. They're doing this tour, 20th anniversary of American Idiot and 30th of Dookie. Uh, Grey Cup, man, they were ahead of the curve getting Green Day at the halftime yep. show. It was they incredible. played in the subway. They played in the New York subway the yeah. other day uh, for a Jimmy Fallon show. I saw. Yeah, they're on Howard Stern as well, so they're doing the media rounds. And uh, I don't know if they were asked about doing the Grey Cup or anything, but that was just a, we knew it was a great get at the time, Huss, and uh, knocked it out of the park there. So we got two hundred and sixty-three marble entries. That's pretty good number hey 63 nice nice um so i don't know i got a track ready Perfect. chill volatile activity Ooh. i don't know Love who it. comes new out track with, new track i don't know who comes out with these names but that's one of them am i putting in any bonus marbles into this one do we have anyone that uh, we should get a marble in for today anything uh, anything noteworthy of uh, of this week it's been a little quiet for the Jets. Been quiet, yeah. I mean, they haven't played the last little bit. Um, it's true. I mean, I would like to put one in for uh, for Mahomes, but uh, I mean, with sixty five percent of people going for Josh Fair. Allen, I'll put in Stanley Bryant for resigning with the Bomber. Had some bombs. Yes, that damn was, right. That was big. Damn right. And you know what? Let's do it. Let's do a Drew Brown. A good luck, Drew Brown. Thanks for being a great backup the last couple of years. We wish him luck. We wish him luck in the future. Sure. We'll throw yeah, old... We're definitely not giving a marvel for Canada Customs. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, the Canada Customs causing you to be late for Monday's show, getting held up at the border with this mysterious uh, package. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know what? You know what? Maybe KFC, the return of KFC. Sure. He can get one too. Nicely done. Nicely done. Up uh, uh, the IGF turf. Shout it to the IGF t- turf <laughs> as well. <laughs> yes, they got new turf. I did read oh, that. Oh, you know what? A great idea, MC Stormy. Put one in for the saxophone Squirtle. All the Jet fans have been loving Squirtle and the uh, the epic sax guy collab. It's been giving good vibes to the Jets. They've been winning. So um, apparently, we'll give, the, we'll give Squirtle. Apparently, the Flyers were pumping saxophone squirtle in the locker room after winning yesterday so not really? just the jets getting on 
Maybe they found that out in uh, in Winnipeg when they were here or something like that. But shout out to mm -hmm. uh, the Jets and uh, and basically Jets social media. I know Nick Lyman's been all over that and. Um, and it's been getting like some people out of the market have kind of been noticing it. Well, along with all the wins that the team has been doing it. But uh, what is this one called again? Chill Volcanic Action? No, no, no. Chill Volatile Activity. Oh, Chill Volatile Activity. I was, I was close. I was close. Um, yeah, we gave uh, we gave one to uh, to do it. Oh, can you still add one more? We should put in Morency. The return of Gabe. Oh, sure. If Lots you've already of... done it, it's we're already in. Gabe. We're already in. Okay, don't worry about it. We'll give Gabe one next week. That'll be another reason to get him back on the show, uh, to get a marble. Yeah. Oh, Matt Hyman says the Rabbi Matt Libel should get one. Too late, but that was a great appearance. Yeah, absolutely. Right, was that great? We'll get Libs on uh, as well. I love talking. Uh, well, Jets, but a lot of NFL with Matt, just like our good old days on the warm up. All right, let's do this. Uh, let's check out. Here we are. We've got. A big crew. Oh, it starts with a nice. I like the big funnel starts. Uh, the, the, it's very key to uh, have a nice start to get down there first. Uh, chill, volatile activity is today's marble race. We are playing for a, a WST hoodie, courtesy of our friends at Shipham and Associates. If you win, you're going to need to send us an email at winnipegsportstalk at gmail.com. We'll set you up for a pickup at some point next week. Shout out to B.A. Booger, who won last week. We'll get you set up next week as well. All right, without further ado, heading into what should be a great sports weekend, let's make it official and drop the marbles on WST. Look at all these marbles here. Oh, man. Here we go. Yeah, the, the marble race continues to grow. This is a very, very high, like there's a lot of speed going into this first funnel. So it will take a little while. Granny Bomber fan in a good position, although a little bit high. Well, it does look like Granny Bomber fan might be number one. There's Tony. Who's going to be first? Tony Dean, Todd 16, Chris Oberton, all looking pretty good. Chris Oberton, a slight lead going into the first. Uh, the fr Whoa, look at that. No, uh, no worries whatsoever for uh, most of them going through that first obstacle. Todd 16, Cosmic Tales MB. Shout out to the folks from 277 Wellington. Oh, geez, Mike Cochran just got thrown over the top rope, as did Dino Apostolopoulos. But right now, in first place, I believe Todd 16 has a very slight, slight lead over Cosmic Tony Dean, Big Daddy Brent as well. Todd's looking good. Oh, Tristan Rivers music over the top rope. Schickster bounced. Bozeman, Mike Wynn also out. Okay, we've now had a split. Tony Dean now in, in first. Oh, and Bravo Bry looking pretty good. Running Man as well in the mix. This is really anybody's race right now. We've got a little bit of a, a stop here. No one's gotten through yet. This is going to be a crazy, crazy finish, I think, with so many marbles right in the mix. I'm going to be going into one of these spinning spheres. Todd 18. Is Todd 18 still in? No, Todd 18 got thrown over the top rope. Who will be first out of this sphere? That is really... Oh, Pat Maroon's bib. We've got an EST tier that's on a lock shopper popping in here. All right. Oh, Todd Fertani in the mix. Jeremy Nickerson right now. Big Daddy Brent. Jeremy Nickerson and Big Daddy Brent. A little bit of a, a, a gap right now. All right. It's going to be coming right down. Do they get caught up in this or do they make it through? No, it's going to be Jeremy Nickerson. I believe Jeremy's been a longtime marble racer. I'm pretty sure that might be Jeremy's first ever dub. So Big congratulations. That was absolutely always nice to see people that have been coming in Friday after Friday without the ultimate victory getting there. So uh, Jeremy, nicely done. Nicely done. Yeah, bravo, bra, you peaked too early. You had a nice run. Pertani was right in there as well. Um, so here's our top 10 for today. Jeremy Nickerson, the winner. Big Daddy Brent right there at the end, finishing second. Dennis Mayuga in third. 
Mr. V Dub in fourth, The Barflies five, Jets number one in sixth, Sean Clark seventh, Patrolman Pete eighth. Stephen Marshall, number nine, and Robert Swanson, number 10. Uh, I see Kelly Menard and uh, Les Thompson. Les, fashionably late, but Les is going to get in and not get burnt by the fire. Jeremy Nickerson. Well done, Jeremy. Congratulations. Uh, send us an email, winnipegsportstalk at gmail.com. Let me know what size of hoodie you take. I think we've got all the sizes still remaining right now, but uh, we uh, should be good. Remo, for those of you that um, you know might be going head to head with each other, here's the uh, here's your full list. I know Bozeman got thrown over the top rope. We'll see if Ross got Ross. All Ross needed to do was finish today in their uh, in their head to head bet that went through. You know they bet each other head to head. Remo every race in 2023. Yeah, and I think it came down to the very final one. Really? Yeah, yeah. Ro- it was that it was it was that close? Ross Ransby and Bozeman, who bet against each other every race. Yeah, it's incredible. One of the great, great rivalries in marbles history here with us oh. on WST. I'm getting ripped uh, for the track. I thought I thought it wasn't like the most amazing, I, but it wasn't terrible. I like, I like that track. I thought it was fine. Some other ones. I, mean, I can again, go, look. They can't all be um, slippery slopes here. Yeah, no doubt. No, I, I had no issue with that track at all. I thought it yeah. was pretty good. And, we, and you know what? You could tell because you had people up in the front that came back. I mean, yeah. no, I actually, that's a bad take. Whoever uh, whoever dropped that one uh, I, that said that was a weak track. Like it wasn't like the most epic elite track there is, but I thought it was a good track. It was maybe a little short. Some new tracks in as well. And it wasn't a million people getting thrown over. It was probably about 50, so about 20% yeah. or so. Yeah. Oh, it's... Ross got bounced too. That's a push, guys. That's a push. Yeah, two thirteen oh. of two sixty seven finish. There you go. Yes, and Kyle Connor with C Y L E and K O N N O R L was uh, was pretty good. Um, great week today. Again, shout out to Connor uh, and Michael for uh, holding it down on Monday for me. Uh, and of course, Kyle or uh, Connor was in last Friday when Michael had a day off. Uh, do not forget. Monday morning. Monday's a game day. So you're going to want to get up to speed on everything that happened this week. And of course, tomorrow against the Ottawa Senators, the Jets this week show with Connor Rabchak will be released early Monday morning in time for your ride to work. Check it out on podcast. Check it out on YouTube before Monday's WST. And Monday will be a great one. Obviously, we'll be recapping what happened with the Jets in Ottawa. We'll be getting ready for a battle of two of the top teams in the NHL, Jets and Boston, on Monday night. And we'll have the four huge playoff games in the NFL to get to as well. Huge thanks to our sponsors who make the show happen each and every day. And all of you, of course, for uh, being a part of the fun. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already on the YouTube channel. And make sure you are subscribed to the podcast. If you found us on YouTube, just put in Winnipeg Sports Talk wherever you get your favorite pods and uh Follow or subscribe there as well so you get the audio feed if you're not able to join us daily on YouTube. For Michael Remus, I'm Andrew Patterson. Always, never, never doubt Patrick Mahomes. That's my final words today. I look forward to talking about the Chiefs in the Final Four next Monday, but it should be a great one. And uh, first things first, Jets tomorrow at 2 p.m. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you Monday. Oh, my God. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.